Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Coffee and Football Signing Day special brought to you by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. I'm your host, Blake Monroe, where I'm joined by Bobby Burton and C.J. Vogel. And guys, it is National Signing Day. Already got a couple of LOIs in. But before we get to that, what's the latest that you guys are hearing right now? Yeah, uh, C.J.'s got the times everybody's supposed to be announcing and committing. Uh, but uh, the latest is two signatures are in. Jarek Gibson, the running back out of IMG Academy, uh, originally committed to Florida, uh, eventually chose Texas uh, back in the spring-summer category. He is now signed with the Longhorns. Michael Kern, punter from Fort Lauderdale's St. Thomas Aquinas, he is signed. So those two signatures are in. We're awaiting 20 or 21 more of those signatures uh, today from future Longhorns will be here throughout the day. A couple of late breaking news items. Uh, Texas still waiting to hear back from Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker out of Jasper, Texas. He's set to announce his decision at 6.15 tonight. Uh, we'll see exactly if Texas made enough inroads in this final official visit, or if the young linebacker decides to stick with the Aggies. Uh, overall, no word from his camp which way he's going quite yet. Aaron Hampton is maybe the news of the day thus far. He, he is the uh, young uh, wide receiver, defensive back out of Dangerfield. We are hear hearing more and more uh, like he may be flipping uh, to Alabama at this time. I, I think that it's, in fact, I believe it's 50, uh, I, I termed it earlier today, 51-49 that he goes to Bama at this point. Obviously, I don't think it's over but I do think it's trending that way. CJ, you have the times for everybody that you've laid out. Uh, make sure you let uh, everyone know exactly what's going on the rest of the day with, with all, all these players. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be an early morning for uh, Bo Davis at 7.30. He'll get the Duncanville duo ready to roll Alex January, Colin Simmons. Uh, shortly after that, DeAndre Robinson also sit, set to sign for his in, uh, NLI. Uh, I'm looking at the list here. You know, it, it it's – We'll progress as the day goes on, but a lot of activity early in the morning. Uh, Freddie, Freddie Dubose, Nate Kibble, Santana Wilson, a lot of other guys from you know out of state also sending in their signatures early as well. So as the show goes on, we'll be uh, you know giving you know a quick brief update and warning for when these guys are are set to roll. And you know, of course, you know you never know a signing day; anything can happen. And we'll be you know keen to to news and updates. Well, hey, CJ, one of those questions that uh, came up late yesterday, Ryan Wingo, uh, the, the wide receiver from uh, St. Louis, Missouri, of course, one of the five stars that Texas has, along with Colin Simmons and Brandon Baker and Xavier Filsamy. Uh, what are you hearing at this point on his recruitment? Because some people are trying to say that he may be waffling here at the last minute. Yeah, no, I mean, with Wingo, it's hard to for, – for schools that lost out originally on the initial – commitment like Missouri it's it's tough to not want to get back involved and you know if you if you have an ace up your sleeve or a Hail Mary trick that you think could get you over the hump it, you'd be foolish to not do that and so that's that's where Missouri is right now it, it it's a last second prayer um right now trying to get into the ear of uh, of Ryan Wingo just you know one last push uh, I heard late last night there's not yet anything to worry about Texas does feel confident they do feel good about uh, Wingo and his status in Austin. Uh, so right now, not yet anything to worry about. We will, again, update if we hear anything going forward into the afternoon. Uh, but right now, I expect Ryan Wingo to sign with Texas. Hey, guys, right. Trey Owens is in. Trey Owens, the quarterback out of uh, Cy Fair High School, 3,333 yards this year passing uh, for Trey Owens. 43 touchdowns, guys, just four interceptions. Ho-hum. He, he, just an easy day, just an easy season uh, there uh, playing uh, for Cy Fair. He also led them, CJ, to an impressive win in the playoffs over Katie. Yeah. Um, it, yet, here, here's my question to you. He was not, he was not considered one of the elite quarterbacks in the country and still is not by most services. Now, he's had, a, he's had two tremendous years. I mean, he's been the district player of the year, two years running. I mean, that, that, in, and that is not an easy district, right? No. Um, it, why explain to fans why Sark you think Sark honed in on him as his quarterback commit of this class, as well as uh, what you think of him long term as a prospect? Yeah, no, I mean, the early interest from Trey Owens and Texas was reciprocal. You know, when Owens got to campus early on, you know, in his sophomore and junior seasons, the, the off seasons, um, 
there was a lot of interest and there was a, you know, a desire to play for Texas. There was a want to be a part of this Texas class. And, you know, I think Sarkeesian saw that mill. We saw that. And it, it, it's tough, you know, when you land guys like Arch Manning, you know, that, that next level of recruiting is something that isn't always easy. You know, guys talk, they see the depth chart. They understand the path to playing is not always the easiest following a recruiting class, similar to what we have seen uh, for Texas at a number of positions, linebacker included in this class as well. So it's interesting, uh, interesting dynamic, if you will, to begin recruiting elsewise. You really got to find a guy that is committed to your school. And of course, when you're the Texas staff and you find a guy that is wanting to be a part of your school, it certainly helps that he's thrown for 45 touchdowns and four interceptions, like Bobby said. You know, there's a lot to be, uh, you know, excited about with Trey Owens. Big body, big build, uh, big arm. And, man, he is competitive. One of my favorite stories is dating back to the spring of this year, you know, just being able to see him run the offense for his seven-on-seven -seven team. He was calling plays. He was manning the huddle. He was the first guy off the sideline in terms of getting – uh, you know, excited about a defensive stop or a turnover or anything along the lines of that. So that's a kid that likes to win. And uh, Blake, I know we talked about it earlier, but that big win over Katie, that's not an easy thing to do, especially for a school like Cy Fair. So uh, impressive stuff all around. And that's kind of the, you know, the, the intangibles that we talked about at the quarterback position, competitiveness and leadership. He's got both of them. And I think that's exactly why T uh, Sarkeesian and Milby thought he was the, the perfect fit for their quarterback room. Let me ask you guys this. Um, when it comes to Trey Owens, what's what's one thing that just popped up off to you right off the bat when looking at his film? Arm, arm talent for me. Mm -hmm. I, that, that's my – I mean, yes, he's it, – it's it's arm talent first and foremost. I think he can make all the throws. Um, then there are some, some other pieces that make me think that his arm talent can translate um, because it's the maneuverability in the pocket. He's not a statue, but he's not a – great athlete like he's not going to get out and run a bunch but it's the arm strength combined with just enough maneuverability in the pocket I think he has a feel for that um, and that makes him I, I, look he, Sark needs quarterbacks that can make all the throws in his mm -hmm. offense deep short etc he's highly accurate he's a 70 plus percent passer in high school um, but I the first thing that jumps off at me is arm talent I, what about you CJ no, I think you touched on it, the maneuverability in the pocket. You know, it's it's one thing to be a, a good quarterback behind a great offensive line. You know, in, in a lot of instances where, you know, some of these quarterbacks uh, that are nationally ranked across the country, they are at programs that are known for developing tremendous talent. I wouldn't say that's necessarily the case right now for, you know, Cypress Fair. And, you know, there's – some really good defenders in that, that conference as well, especially on the defensive line. We've seen Harold Perkins in that, that district, especially wreak havoc. And so I, I think it's uh, something to say about Trey Owens and what will be almost a, a sigh of relief for him going into college football, where he's going to have talented offensive linemen in front of him. He's going to have a breath, but as a result of playing behind that line and at Cy Fair, I think it's uh, you know, a, a skill and a trait that he's been able to learn that many quarterbacks haven't, really been tested about and that's being able to maneuver feeling pressure behind you uh you know just being able to elude pressure off the edges and still make plays down the field that's what really stands out to me whenever i watched him in in person this year i go ahead bobby i, I think you're about no, to say, I just say three three signees in so far if you're just joining us and we're trying to keep everybody updated uh trey owens the quarterback that we were just talking about michael kern the punter out of fort lauderdale and jarek gibson was the first to sign this morning he did that he did so in the six o'clock hour he was he was chomping at the bit a little bit uh to get it in uh, out of img academy lives in ocala florida uh down in the, in central florida uh look we're expecting at least 22 possibly 23 signatures for the longhorns uh, to recap uh we're waiting on ty anthony smith out of jasper uh texas to make his decision he does not he's not expected to announce until 6 15 tonight but word could leak out earlier than that Furthermore, we're waiting on Aaron Hampton and what he ultimately decides, uh, because right now it sounds like it could be Texas or Alabama. And Alabama uh, has been one of those teams that uh, has been a thorn in Texas' side uh, at this point. Uh, uh, hold on a sec. Oh, OK. And CJ, tell us why you think Alabama is making inroads with 
uh, with uh, Aaron Hampton at this point. Yeah, Aaron Hampton. I mean, we, it's kind of the talk of the, the, the morning so far in terms of the Texas uh, 2024 class. Alabama's prioritizing him at wide receiver, and that is attractive to him. That is something that, you know, Texas is kind of, you know, on the fence, giving him a, a, a true look as an athlete, if you will. Uh, once he were to get to campus, I'm told he does prioritize the wide receiver position. Uh, he likes scoring touchdowns. You see the film. He's all over the place in terms of, uh, you know, making plays offensively, getting the ball in his hands, and and really being a menace offensively. So uh, that's where Alabama sees him currently. That's where they're pitching him. That is attractive to him, and that is why we're seeing some of this late movement, kind of this uh, on the fence approach to his signing day right now, and uh, that it's given him a lot to think about at the moment. Yeah. Texas recruited him as both a safety and wide receiver, and they were going to let him try to figure it out uh, once he got on campus. Uh, let's see what happens, uh, because I don't know uh, that uh, I don't know what's going to end up uh, happening at this point. But we are hearing a lot more and more about Alabama. I will say this. I, I'm not concerned about Texas recruiting class overall. Ryan Wingo uh, has been there's been some thought that maybe he's uh, moving around. Potentially, uh, we have heard that that's in, inaccurate. Uh, I also think that we're also, you know, interested in other people's recruiting and other teams across the country. Texas A&M made a last minute dash for Derek Lagway, the nationally rated quarterback out of Willis, Texas, uh, that had been committed to uh, uh, Florida as of uh, really since last summer. Uh, but A&M, it doesn't look like it's going to get get in that one, even though Mike Elko made a home visit. It sounds like if anybody does, USC <clears throat> will be the team there to watch out for. So a lot of a lot of stuff happening this morning. <coughs> oh. Y'all take it for a second. All right, Bobby. Uh, Parker Livingstone, the wide receiver from Lovejoy, is in officially. Texas just announced that one. So, CJ, I'm going to ask you, like I did with Trey Owens, immediately what pops off to you about Parker? Well, it's his size and his ability to combine that with elite playmaking ability. I mean, he's able to stretch the field. He can take a screen pass 80 yards. He returns punts and kicks. You know, this isn't your typical slow, big body possession guy. While he possesses those traits, slow's not in the repertoire. You know, this is a guy that runs track, multi-sport athlete, and he makes plays every time I've seen him. I mean, he's been tremendous on the field. Dating back to his sophomore year at Lovejoy, uh, he's burst on the scene, and he's had the fight for his fair share of reps. You know, at Lovejoy, there, there's no shortage of receivers. Kyle Parker ended up at LSU, Jackson Lavender at SMU. Uh, this year, Damon McCutcheon, talented 2025 guy as well. You know, there's a lot to go around in that Lovejoy offense, and Parker Livingstone, for my money's worth, has made plays every single time he's been on the field, and it's been impressive. I'm really interested to see how Sarkeesian uses him because there is flexibility with where you can put him on the line. Obviously, it fits for him with his size to be on the outside, but Lovejoy uses him everywhere. He's been, you know, used in the slot before. He's been used in motion. He's thrown a couple touchdown passes. I'm not to say, you know, that's in the works as well, but that just shows the versatility that comes with Parker Livingstone's game. And again, uh, all it takes really, and Bobby, you mentioned it, you know, I, I believe yesterday, the 50-50, you know, toss-up balls are something that will always favor Livingstone with his height and his ability to go get it. Uh, that's something that's very encouraging. And, you know, moving forward, the contestant – Contested catches with this wide receiver group is going to be something that is a strength. It's not, and you know what Parker Livingstone has is it's not just his height; it's his ability to adjust to the balls in the air. Like I don't look. Look, I think I we were talking even before we went on as Texas versus Rice is on LHN right now, and I saw Xavier Worthy make a play, and I said, "Look, Texas is going to miss Xavier Xavier Worthy more than people realize next year because he's able to get work free underneath because people respect his speed over the top." But even so, even that being the case, CJ and Blake, um, Xavier Worthy is not a big 50-50 catch ball, right? That, that's not his game. He doesn't catch well downfield when contested. Um, Parker Livingstone is a lot different in that regard in that he does a great job moving his body in the air and redirecting it to create space for himself. Um, he is... In other words, I don't think he's a 50-50 receiver. I think he's a 65-35 receiver on downfield balls. And that that is a different different kind of category, um, especially uh, in uh, when you move to the SEC, where, frankly, there are going to be better DBs uh, that, that you're going to have to face than you 
than uh, in the in the uh, Big 12. And so you're going to have to have guys that can go up and make those contested catches when Arch Manning is the quarterback. I mean, I, I don't see Parker Livingstone playing right away at Texas. He may play some, but my point being, you're they're going to line up and put eight in the box and make, make you beat them one-on-one -on -one outside in the SEC. Parker Livingstone is that guy with his body size that can make those catches and, and contort his body. Uh, I, I, I love the pickup uh, there. I think he is one of the under, more underrated players in this recruiting class. No doubt about it. All right, guys, you're watching the Coffee and Football Signing Day special brought to you by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. And we will get to some questions throughout the show, so be sure to ask those. We'll take as many as we can. And, uh, guys, before we get on to the next LOI that's going to come in here, uh, let's let's take a couple of questions because this is a hot topic. And Ray Potter wants to know, the question is, do we flip to Anthony Smith or is he just trolling at this point? Who knows? <laughs> Ray, that's why that's why you're here. That's why we're here. This is the fun part of recruiting. I mean, look, I mean, if if there wasn't drama involved, would we, would we all be here? I think that that's part of the fun of it. Um, he's expected to announce his decision today at 615. It could leak out sooner than that, guys. Uh, but right now, right now, uh, that that is uh, that's what we're waiting on. We do not have insight that says he's definitely doing this or definitely doing that. If we did, we would we would pass it on to you guys. Uh, but I will say this: Texas remains hopeful. Texas remains hopeful. That's about as as far as I could go any which way on that right now. Yeah, and you know, just real quick, Blake, uh, with Ty Anthony Smith, all the signs leading up to a potential flip that were uh, something to look for out uh, previously, they occurred. Uh, all the, the warning signs and kind of, you know, if this happens, watch out for that. That did happen this past weekend uh, from what I heard behind the scenes. So I do feel confident. And like Bobby said, Texas is hopeful. So we'll see around 615 tonight. But I know there's new news here from Blake. So let's get to it. Uh, yeah. So five star safety Xavier Phil to me is the end. Huge get there for the Longhorns. Just happened a couple days ago. Flipped him from Florida, guys. You know, Texas got in on him a little late, but in, in the long run, they did prevail there. What does he bring to the table? Speed and a lot of it. You know, that's a <laughs> lot of athleticism. That's a, a whole lot of athleticism and speed coming into this Texas secondary. And that's really exactly what you want. You know, you want a guy with instincts. You want a guy that can fly around the field. And Xavier Phil to me fills that, get, that, that void right there. You know, he's all over the place in his, uh, his film. You know, what's really impressive to me is – while he does bring a lot of speed, he's physically ready. You know, that's that's part of that five-star rating right there. He can step in and with, you know, very little weight room that is necessary, he will be ready physically for uh, college football. And also, I, I mentioned it previously, and, and Bobby, you can attest to this, you know, that that film that he, that he plays with, that McKinney defense, you cannot be soft in that defense. You have to be able to run and hit, and that's exactly what he brings to the table uh, with uh, Coach Shavers over there at McKinney. does a tremendous job of getting his defensive guys ready to roll and being able to hit, not fearful of that. Running the alley is very impressive, and, and Rob talks it all the time about being an alley cat. That's exactly what you can expect from Xavier Filsamy. I, I love it. I, look, uh, Rod also talks about this, and I agree with him 100% is the idea that Texas needs to improve its overall speed in the secondary. This is a guy that ran a 10-5-2, is that right? At one point, FAT, uh, mm -hmm. fully automated 100-meter uh, dash. Uh, that Add him. You, you have Derek Williams back there. You add some of the other guys coming in, Wardell Mack, Kobe Black, uh, Santana Wilson in this grouping. And all of a sudden, you're looking at different caliber guys, in my opinion, CJ. And um, – you know, maybe the defensive backfield was the first, was the last piece of Steve Sarkeesian building it, and now he's even, he's going to have to rebuild the wide receiver room, right? So it's going to be this ongoing process. But uh, I think that the that probably the most impressive group of guys coming to Texas this year may be this secondary group. Uh, if you really look at it top to bottom, there's not a guy out there that wasn't a national elite level recruit, whether it was Wilson, uh, Phil Samee. Mac uh, or uh, Kobe Black, all of them nationally ranked recruits. Yeah, Bobby, to that point, I mean, 
we can go back a few recruiting classes now and say when there's a need, they fill it. 2022 and the offensive line. Last year we saw it with the linebackers and the edge rushers. There's been a fill – or, you know, anytime there's been a void, that Texas staff has worked tremendously hard to fill it. This year defensive backs has been no different. Good point. Really good point because – but hey, an edge this year. Yeah. yeah Had absolutely. to have Colin Simmons. Had to have somebody – that. I mean, they, they said, we've got to get after the passer better. And that starts in the high school ranks. And what do they go out and do? They get Colin Simmons. Um, so I, I would say those. All right, guys. Bobby, you mentioned speed. And David Parcell wants y'all's opinion. Who's faster, Phil Samy or Derek Williams? You know, these are interesting questions. Phil Samy, I think, is faster outright. Like, you know, if you put, put him in a 100-meter 100, 100 dash. The, the question that I have, and, and one of these things that – I know everybody that's ever played sports understands who's quicker sometimes means more than who's faster. But how do you appropriately gauge quickness, right? There's no 40-yard dash, dash time that everybody can point to. 40-yard dash isn't necessarily quickness. Um, and Zay, Derek Williams is plenty, plenty quick. He has what I would call suddenness, Right. When he decides he's going to close on a ball, his first five yards are as good as anybody's are, are going to be. Um, uh, we'll see if Xavier feels to me is the same way. We, Even though we see it on film in high school, it, it, the real test we all know is college. So you can have a five-star whatever, but until they strap on the chin strap uh, and uh, buckle it up uh, in college, you don't really know. Uh, so I, I don't know. I think I think uh, feels to me is faster. I don't know who is quicker. Hopefully, they're equally quick. Because if, if Phil Samy is qu as quick as Derek Williams, they've got a tandem back there. I, I, a real, real tandem long term. All right, Bobby. Before we move on here, I'm going to let you tell everybody out there about Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Adam is our friend uh, with the Lowy Law Firm. He has been uh, with us from the very start. He's sponsoring uh, today's Coffee and Football Extended Edition uh, of the uh, of coffee and football, uh, Adam, you reach out to him uh, any which way you want, whether it's online uh, via LoweyLawFirm.com or via cell phone, uh, 512-280-0800. If you've been injured in a wreck or on the job and think you might deserve compensation, you can get a free consultation. That's right. It's free with Adam and the Lowy Law Firm, 512-280-0800 or visit him at LoweyLawFirm.com. Okay, guys. Well, we've had a lot of people join us since we first started. So let's start <laughs> over with who has signed so far. And we'll start with Jarrett Gibson, uh, the running back out of Florida. I'm going to let one of y'all tell everybody out there about Gibson. Man, I mean, he's a fun one. I mean, th that alone right there. Look at the arms. Look at the physique. You know, when you talk about talented running backs, that's what it is. I mean, five nine and a half, two fifteen. He will run through you. There's no shortage of that. The film shows it. Uh, the the obviously the build allows for that to happen. And to shard choice, I mean, to go out and find two out of state running backs just goes to show how easily, or, well, not easily because obviously he's a hard worker, but how I guess the Texas running back room is now. Uh, perceived by the national running back uh, prospects across the country. So Jarrett Gibson, obviously very talented out of IMG Academy. Uh, he will run through a face if you know what I'm getting at right here. So uh, very impressive. I do think he's a great addition, a, a, a nice duo to go along with um, Christian Clark, who will be signing later this, this morning. So uh, a big fan of, of, of Jarrett Gibson's and, and what he brings to the table. Uh, Bobby, you talked about, you know, kind of the speed or kind of the combination of speed and physicality previously. I want to hear again what you have to say yeah. there. Yeah, I saw him in person this year, actually. Uh, got a chance to see him. He played Lipscomb Academy uh, uh, in an away game. Uh, look, I think that he is a tremendous uh, physical player. So he's not bothered by the physicality, whether it's going to whether it's going to be the SEC or the NFL. That's not going to bother him. We got to see if he has the feet through the hole and the quickness to make it all work for him. Uh, but I saw him literally get attacked by four players, bounce <laughs> off of them, and get two yards. Right? It's it's that kind of physicality that he brings to the table, um, and I think he's still going to get better. Uh, this is a running back groom uh, 
uh, with him and Christian Clark, two guys that I think catch the ball well out of the backfield, two guys that I think are physical players um, and have the ability to play hard-nosed football in the SEC. And I think that that's what Tar- – Tashard Choice, I-, I think that's what he's attracted to and drawn to, by the way, as a running back coach. Trey Wisner is not the biggest guy in the room, right? But Cedric Baxter is one of the bigger running backs you'll see. Well, Cedric Baxter does clearly doesn't have problem with contact, but I would say that for his size, Trey Wisner is a physical running back. I mean, it, I know he's not. I, I mean, I'm not saying that's what he's, his calling card's going to be, but you tell me Trey Wisner's not tough on the football field. Yeah. I think that's like the number one category that the shard choice looks for in a running back. Is he tough? And then let's look at all the other things around him because that's that's the one category I think that, that choice is attracted to as much as anything. And then he tries to figure out if he has the elite skills in another way that can fit within the offense. I got Melvin Hills is now officially in. And as you can see here, the defensive lineman out of Lafayette, Louisiana. CJ, tell us a little bit about Melvin Hills. Yeah, this was an interesting uh, recruitment. You know, Melvin Hills, Bo Davis really circled him early in this cycle and and got him to campus uh, pretty often. It was, you know, pretty interesting. I, I believe sometime in the spring we were talking to him after his visit and he basically just said, you know, I, I, I don't want to stay at home. I want to leave. I, I don't have no interest in LSU. It, it was very bizarre. You know, it was you don't normally hear that from a guy from Lafayette, uh, Louisiana, someone who's as coveted as uh, Melvin Hills was on the defensive side of the ball, especially. You know, when you think of defensive backs and defensive linemen in the state of Louisiana, very rarely do they leave home. Melvin Hills wanted out. Texas wanted him. And it was a perfect marriage from there. Ole Miss made a late push as well. Uh, but but. I mean, it's tough to beat Bo Davis when he's doing what he's doing right now uh, with his Texas defensive lineman. And, and, and that's really, you know, one of the biggest factors that he saw. He saw Keandre Coburn and Mauro Ojimo last year. And he said, you know, I see the development. I see the NFL push from them too. I want to be a part of that. And that was prior to what we've seen so far from Byron Murphy and Devondre Sweat. So he was an early believer and he's going to, you know, reap the, the benefits of uh, trusting in Bo Davis. I would add one comment here. Um, He is a developmental prospect. He is raw, um, plays in a smaller school league, Lafayette Christian. But Bo Davis likes the mental makeup, too. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what I've been told is that, look, he's going to come to work each and every day. And that's what Bo, he wants to see not what Melvin Hills is day one, but what's he going to be in year three at Texas. And that's the important part to him, I think developmental prospects are what Bo Davis really likes. Yes, they can have um, higher upside and all this other stuff. They want that too. But ultimately, he wants to mold these guys and bring them in and have two years with them uh, so that they're literally that kind of player, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's that's where Melvin Hills fits uh, within this recruiting class for the University of Texas. All right, well, while we wait for the next one to come in, we're going to go back to some of these guys that we haven't talked about too much. And one of those is the player often overlooked, Michael Kern. Obviously, special teams, very important. I'll let one of y'all tell everybody out there about Kern. Yeah, absolutely. So Fort Lauderdale, St. Thomas Aquinas is maybe, if not one of the top two or three programs in the country for producing Division One prospects. It's like, I'll tell you what it is. It's like the modern day. Santa, Santa Ana Mater Day, California of Florida. I mean, I, I can't tell you who all's come out of there. I mean, so uh, just I think they've had something like 12 NFL players over the years. It's it's ridiculous. Uh, Kern is a punter. Uh, he was ranked, I think, by Coles Kicking Academy, the second or third punter in the country. Jeff Banks, obviously, uh, picked him up early uh, and identified him early and said, this is the guy we want uh, and went after him, got him. Uh, he... Uh, You know, Aquinas doesn't punt that much, to be fair. Uh, They're pretty (laughs) dominant program. Uh, So a lot of these guys, whether it's Will Stone or Burt Auburn or any of the specialists, they get identified in kicking camps. Uh, You see him right there with that Chris Saylor Kicking Academy um, uh, shirt on. Those sorts of things are are where these guys get their scholarships from. Uh, So, you know, hopefully he's a guy that has good hang time. Uh, can average 43, 44 plus 
uh, early in his career. I would not be surprised, though, if Texas didn't bring in a uh, portal punter just to make sure, uh, like, like Daniel Trejo was, guys, two years ago. Texas got him at the very last minute just to make sure the guy from Australia didn't, you know, didn't spit the bit. Well, the guy from Australia spit the bit. And so they inserted Daniel Trejo and, and rolled with him. I wouldn't be surprised for Texas to do that as well, even though Michael Kern, a part of this signing class. Uh, we're going to take a couple more questions here. And uh, let's, And I answered Art in the chat, but he says, is there any chance the Horns move up in the recruiting top five? And currently, guys, they are in the top five. And if you'll give me one second here, I'm going to bring this up so we can talk about it. All right. I, look, I don't think they're going to move much up from the top five unless someone, something like Dominic McKinley dominoes today. The defensive lineman out of Lafayette, five-star. Uh, there's some thought that he might sign with Texas, might sign with AM, might sign with LSU today, uh, might take a, a visit this spring to USC. Uh, at this point, uh, I was told that he is not exp expected to sign with anybody. He's a long-term A&M commitment. Uh, but the Aggies are in a state of flux right now and turmoil that have been rare. Uh, so I don't see Texas moving up, even with a pledge from Ty Anthony Smith. Maybe they move up to four there, uh, but it would be it would be a, it would be on the edge. Uh, that that being said, don't forget Texas will still be recruiting people into the second signing period. So this isn't actually the final final rankings uh, for this class. It will be, however, uh, the preponderance like. We'll get 21, 22 signees today, and then they'll cherry pick one, two, three others uh, for the spring, for the uh, February 7th signing period. All right, Nate Kibble is in, guys. So, CJ, give us the rundown on Kibble. Man, he's a fun one. Uh, a pure guard, you know, a, a true interior guy. Uh, you see it there, only six two and a half, right around six three, probably uh, when he's fully padded up. One of the guys that really stood off the page whenever, you know, I would head to Atascacita to watch Cam du Dewberry back in the day. And, you know, alongside Dewberry, you're watching a kid push, you know, a uh, defensive lineman back, you know, seven, eight yards. And you're wondering, you know, where did this guy come from? Well, sure enough, Nate Kibble uh, was exactly who that was. And it's exciting to see his growth. You know, Texas was in on him and then things went pretty quiet. Nate Kibble's not a, a, a guy that, you know, plays a social media game. He wasn't a big recruiting uh, a world kind of guy in terms of camps and and being on the scene. So uh, when he got to campus in Texas, you know, deemed him a take, I think a lot of people were a little bit surprised and said, you know, kind of where did he come from? And then you turn on the tape and you see exactly why, you know, Kyle Floods, you know, saw so much potential in Nate Kibble. Uh, and one thing is true, uh, if, if I've ever learned anything, Bobby, is a Tascacita offensive linemen pan out more so than they don't. And uh, I think that's more exciting than anything else. And, you know, Nate Kibble is a guy who has his head on straight, comes from a good family. And when you talk about getting down to work, getting down to business and, and really, you know, grinding, you know, you should have seen where he was a few years ago and where he is now. That's a testament to how – go ahead. I agree. I agree with you. So the, the Atascacita offensive line coach may deserve a, a college job. I mean, Sam Cosby's from Atascacita. Mm -hmm. Kenyon Green, first round pick from Atascacita. Cam Dewberry up at A&M's been a, was a starter as a true freshman for the Aggies. Now you have Nate Kibble coming in. Nate Kibble was a finalist for the Houston Area Touchdown Club Award on offense as a lineman. Yep. Um, what I like and what I think Texas likes about him, CJ and, and Blake, is this. Daniel Cruz is your center. Daniel Cruz does not have great arm length. He, he, so one, if you had to say, what is the one negative on Daniel Cruz? It would be arm length. Now he's not short armed. Like it's not that issue, but he doesn't have great arm length. What does Nate Kibble have? 80 plus wingspan. So they're going to, you see what I'm saying? They're going to put those guys beside Daniel Cruz on the interior to shore up that kind of stuff, yet still have the power in the run game. That's why they attack Daniel Cruz uh, as as a as a part of this recruiting class, they think he fits again pieces of what they want to do. And I, I look, you can you can question a lot of things about Steve Sarkeesian, uh, but his roster management and construction of it, Billy Glasscock and those guys at direct, director of player personnel, 
you can't really do that. I mean, uh, not only Steve Sarkeesian, he's not the only guy. Glasscock's not the only guy. Jeff Banks does a great job of kind of uh, piecemealing this together as well. Uh, so do a number of other uh, assistant coaches. We mentioned Tashard Choice. Uh, and then, you know, guys like <laughs> Terry Joseph and Blake Gideon, Gideon getting in on the action. Bo Davis. Uh, just uh, Sark's created a really a, a great system that he's running right now on in the recruiting game because it's filling – it's being smart in a number of ways, right? They're good recruiters, but they're also smart recruiters. Like I, I used to know these recruiters that would go out there and just sign whoever they could, but they wouldn't end up with a football team. They end up with a, an accumulation of talent, not necessarily a football team. One of the things I love about what Texas and Sark's doing, it's not, it's, it's like what we talked about with Evan Stewart. They're not trying to find an, an accumulation of stars. They're trying to find an accumulation of football players that fit what they want to do. And I, that's, I'm a big, big, big fan of what they're doing. And Nate Kibble with that arm length, like I talked about CJ is part of that process. Yeah. Another, and another guy from a winning program too, CJ. Absolutely. Those, those things are important. Uh, we're going to take a couple more questions while we wait here. Uh, Mayo Soto has a question for you, Bobby. He said yesterday you tweeted. Wait, the text no, from- no, 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 stop, stop. <laughs> Colin Simmons is in. Oh, we got to stop. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll come back to that question. I hope yeah, everybody we will. <laughs> Colin Simmons is in for the University of Texas, uh, one of the state's top prospects, if not the very top prospect. 30-plus uh, sacks, 6'2 225 225-pound edge, five-star consensus on three uh, consensus. Uh, look at this, guys. Uh, if there was one player in the state of Texas that Texas had to have in this recruiting class, it was Colin Simmons. Uh, Make no mistake about it. Uh, The Longhorns held off a number of suitors. LSU was the one that Texas really was concerned about. And the Tigers made it tough down to the very, very end. Uh, But absolutely huge. Colin Simmons has signed with the University of Texas. Uh, It doesn't get much better than this. State championship game, defensive MVP, two years in a row. Um, What does he have, like 75 tackles for loss in his career, CJ? Uh, it's insane uh, that just how good Colin Simmons has been and can be. Uh, and I expect him to be one of those guys that plays early at Texas and tries to get him on the field, not unlike they kind of got Anthony Hill in early this year because he's that kind of disruptive player. Yeah, Bobby, to your point about getting on the field, you know, if you can get to the quarterback, you will have a place on the field immediately. And that's all Colin Simmons has ever done in high school. You know, you see, you, you, you listed the stats. Uh, the film is something that really is impressive. The bend, his size and the athleticism to get around offensive tackles. You know, there are times where he's in the backfield before the offensive lineman or offensive tackles, even out of his stance. It's that quick for Colin Simmons. It's what made him so highly coveted and what gave him five stars next to his name. So with Colin Simmons, what is also exciting is, you know, just the motor. You know, you talk about being able to get to the quarterback, but also being able to chase down running backs that are going the opposite way. Being able to stick with rollouts and come from the backside and and, and create tackles for loss or, or impact passes on the line of scrimmage. One thing that really stands out to me about this staff, and it, it's prevalent here, obviously, with Colin Simmons, but when there is a, a guy at top of the board in the state of Texas or really in surrounding states – that Texas and their staff feels like they cannot miss on, they don't. And Colin Simmons is exactly that. It took a little bit last year with Anthony Hill, but they got him in the bag. Obviously, Kelvin Banks and DJ Campbell in 2022, where are they now? They're at Texas. Arch Manning is the big one as well. Colin Simmons was who that was this year. Texas needed immediate edge presence in the recruiting class in 2024. They went out to Duncanville, and they found him, and they got it exactly what they wanted in a five-star edge. Uh, This is going to be one that Texas fans are very excited about moving forward. And when you kind of sit back and, you know, think about the tandem between him and Anthony Hill rushing the passer, I mean, it it, it brings a lot of excitement when you consider the SEC move and the big stages Texas will eventually be playing on. I'm I'm just a big, big, big fan. Uh, Look, college football games, we talk about this. uh, They're made with big plays a lot especially when you see Texas playing for national championships or in the college football semifinal, Anthony Hill may make a play right in this game. Xavier worthy may make a play. 
A.D. Mitchell may make a play. Quinn Ewers. Um, you're looking for guys that can make plays at the biggest times. And yep. that, in my opinion, is what Colin Simmons has the ability to do. Um, that, that's that's the best way I can put it. And one of the reasons why I think uh, Texas is is so so excited about having him. And uh, I, look, there is no big, there was no bigger recruitment this year than Colin Simmons. To have his signature come through the door right now, huge. Period. That's why I stopped the question mid sentence when I saw it. <laughs> it, it. It legitimately is as big as it's going to get for Texas this year because it also, hey CJ, it also was a perception thing. Yep. You know what? After that, some other guys started to commit. Ryan Wingo started to commit. Kobe Black started to commit. Brandon Baker started to commit. You, you get my point, right? It trickles it started, down absolutely. It started the crescendo, right? Because he was the guy that everybody was looking to. I'm not saying he was Arch Manning in this category, right? Where it, he was the, the Pied Piper, Arch was last year. He was actually one of the guys that started the process, CJ. Yeah, Bobby, real quick to that point. He's also a guy in the DFW area with two defensive MVPs under his belt. People in DFW respect him. They see, oh, if, if Colin Simmons is considering Texas, maybe I should as well. I see a lot of Jonte Cook in that realm. Uh, you know, a lot of people in the Texas, you know, offensive area, they look at John Tay Cook as a guy that they highly respect, obviously, on the seven on seven scene. Uh, they see him compete. They see the talent and they understand that, you know, there's a reason why these guys are going to Texas now. And it's not, you know, to, to mosey around and, and play in the Alamo Bowl. No, you're seeing it on the field immediately. And Colin Simmons is going to have that same effect. Uh, John Tay Cook had obviously Arch Manning made that uh, national headlines as well. So. This does matter, and it is going to matter for the 2025 class as well when you consider who else in the Dallas area is highly coveted at the moment. Guys, I, I, just so you all know, I want to I want to be clear. Uh, Texas is purposely spacing these announcements out. So there are actually guys that have already signed that, and, and I know a couple. I'm just going to – I'm going to be clear. There are guys that have already signed. Texas is spacing these announcements out so that the kids get there 10, 15 minutes – or five minutes, what have you, so people like myself and CJ and you, Blake, can all talk about it, right, uh, and give them their appropriate due. Uh, I think that there's already, if I'm counting right, uh, based on what I'm being told here, there's already 15-plus guys that have signed, um, that they're just waiting to roll out. There will be more uh, as we get going today uh, and be able to talk about them. But, uh, all right, we can go back to questions now that we got Colin Simmons uh, discussing <laughs> out of the way. I'm sorry about that, guys. No, but no, you're, you're – Break in on that one. No, it was – hey, Bobby, it was worth breaking in for. <laughs> so, I don't <laughs> think Manuel will uh, will mind at all. But we'll go back to his question real quick. He asked, yesterday you tweeted that Texas was not done. Was that in reference to Brown? If not, do you have any hints? Yeah, it was, it was in reference specifically to Brandon Brown. Um, that's when I – I, I literally, so y'all, y'all will notice sometimes I, we have to pre-tape these commitment videos. Um, I knew uh, about, I guess, a couple hours ahead of time that that was happening. Uh, and that's when I got CJ and said, hey, we need to do a video uh, and get ready for this because this is getting ready to happen. Uh, and so that was in reference to that. And then we're going to go back to Colin Simmons real quick because Megan says, when the last time that we've gotten edge players of this caliber? You know, um, a while. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Joe Osai was probably the last elite, elite guy. He's a top 50 guy in the country, right? Um, anybody else that you could, you know, that that is the last position that Texas hadn't gotten a five-star out of. I, I know it's Steve Sarkeesian because they've gotten one on the offensive line. They've gotten JT Sanders at tight end. Uh, they've gotten one at uh, running back with Cedric Baxter. They have one at wide receiver with Xavier Worthy. Um, they have one at quarterback with Arch and Quinn. They have one along – did they have one along the defense? Oh, Sadir Mitchell was not a five-star, but he was recruited like a five-star. They hadn't had a, an edge guy. They'd had a, the linebacker with Anthony Hill. They had Derek Williams in the secondary, Manny Muhammad. So, really, defensive line and edge were the two that Steve Sarkeesian hadn't signed that marquee guy, right? And so, to, to your question – there they have signed now a marquee guy at, at a couple different spots that they hadn't before. All right, we got uh some more news here as Zena Umazulu has signed, guys. The edge prospect while we're on the subject of edge yeah. <laughs> of uh, Allen, Texas. 
And CJ, I'm going to let you tell everybody out there about Zena and what he brings to the table for the Longhorns. Yeah, real quick, you know, if you hear anything banging around in the back of, of uh, the background right now, just know the trash truck is right outside my window. So <laughs> apologies there. But, I mean, Zena is prototypical what you want as an edge rusher. He has length. He has the height. He has the frame that allows you to build weight onto that as well while maintaining the bend and athleticism that you covet uh, for – you know, prime edge rushers. And the thing with Zena is, is when he's on and he's playing a hundred percent at, at his motor, it's very impressive. And there's very rarely uh, uh, times where he's stymied on the pass rush. You know, there's, he, he, he can obviously improve on the, the, the pass rush techniques, uh, some of the hand movement as well. But that, I mean, that's the case with every edge rusher uh, coming out of high school, but Zena, the thing is, when he's on, and I, I'll, I'll continue to pound that drum, it, it's hard to find guys that have more production off the edge. Uh, and obviously, his brother, Nato, you know the nastiness, the, the feistiness, you know, kind of the, the chip on the shoulder play style that they play with and have played with, you know, since being at Allen together. I think that's going to be something to watch a whole lot of, you know, this spring is, you know, if the two are paired to go together, that's going to be something that drives them even more uh, to get better and get the better of one another, not only, uh, you know, in, in practice, but moving forward into the summer as well. So uh, length, athleticism, and bend is what stands off the page whenever you talk about Zena. Uh, very impressive. And when you combine that with what's across from him or what will be in this, you know, theoretical 2024 class, it's very exciting on the, uh, the athleticism that's coming to the edge for Texas. And then, Bobby, I'm going to let you chime in. China chime in as well on Zena. I get it right here in a second. Yeah, absolutely. I was typing in Zena's name in the scroll. Uh, so we can make sure everybody, I'm trying to keep up with the scroll, guys. So everybody that's coming in late can see what has happened thus far. Um, hey, by the way, uh, Zena Umiozulu, I think the one uh, thing that you guys need to know is this was not a cow and the calf. We have we have Neto, so we want Zena too. Texas loved Zena from the very start, passed on numerous other prospects that the pundits have ranked ahead of Zena, actually, uh, to take Zena uh, over the other guys. One of the reasons why, when he came into town uh, and for his unofficial visit and then his official visit, uh, Texas got him at a height and weight and a physicality. Uh, they, they think that he is going to be a grown man in two to three years. They just see a guy that can put on the right kind of weight, stay physical, stay athletic within it, and they're going to look up in two or three years. He's going to be 250 plus pounds, six foot five, and have an 82, 83 inch wingspan. Um, that's what they see. They see a guy that's just getting started, being who he can be. He's had to play. I mean, this year he played middle linebacker. And, you know, his team tried to use him at middle linebacker, six foot five, middle linebacker. Okay, I don't think that's where he's going to play in college, right? And so get him in the get him in the in the in the program. And again, Steve Sarkeesian, I, I use this term called take and bake. You know, you take the commitment and then you let him bake for a couple of years. That's the, that is a real thing, because if you have the culture, if you have the strength and conditioning program, if you have a, a supportive environment for these guys, that's what happens. And that's where you can go with this. And I, I think that Texas uh, right now is doing a great job as it relates to that. Hey, Bobby, you know what really helps the evaluation process? Seeing a, his brother, two years older than 300 plus pounds, <laughs> while still yep. being able to move very well. Yes. You know, he, he's listed right around 230, but you know, because of NATO, there is room to build while also maintaining that athleticism. So that is something that is very encouraging uh, once you consider the take and bake kind of approach of putting on 20 or 30 pounds and being able to be that physical presence that you want on off the edge. So uh, just two cents right there, but it, it, it helps a whole lot in the end. I guess Jordan Washington, the tight end out of Langone Creek, is in the fold now officially. CJ? Give us the rundown on Jordan. Yeah, I'm a sucker for tight ends that play or that come from a basketball background. And and Jordan Washington is exactly that, you know, uh, just being able to high point, you know, uh, whether it be the football or a basketball and in basketball that I think the, the biggest thing that translates to the football field is being able to make contested catches. You know, that when you get into the paint in basketball, there's 
you know, no, no less than four or five bodies at a time. And you're banging around. You, you're you never going to catch a ball cleanly unless you're able to sky higher than many people on the court. And at 6'4", that's not necessarily the tallest, uh, you know, tallest guy that you'll see on a basketball court. But, you know, when it comes to football and when it comes to, you know, going up against safeties or, or even linebackers at times, 6'4 is enough to be, uh, you know, a, a couple inches you know, bigger, higher, taller, whatever you want to call it, than, than you know, the guy opposing you. So I, I love it. I love the athleticism. Uh, that There's a willingness on his film to go hit. I, I know that with tight ends out of high school, especially with basketball backgrounds, that's not always a strength. But when you have the willingness, it certainly helps in the long run or long term run in terms of getting the physical body ready for it. Uh, you cannot teach wanting to go hit somebody. It's innate. It's something that you either have or you don't have. And with Jordan Washington, I see the willingness. And with room to grow in the weight room, it's something that will only help his uh, long-term effect in terms of the run in the pass game in the in the trenches. Hey, uh, um, we need to circle back. I, I love Jordan Washington. I'm I I'm with CJ. Basketball players turning tight end. That here's here's the key to that though. Okay, there's one key. It's not the physical ability. It's not the athleticism. It's are they physical when they put the pads on? There are six foot five basketball players out there that try to play like a small forward and not get not get dirty, right? Yep. If he puts the pads on and is a physical blocker, I want him. Jordan Washington did that. The other thing that I would I would uh, caution everybody: he was not a lightly regarded recruit. You saw. Put, put his uh, stats back up again real quick, Blake, and I'm going to explain what I'm talking about here, uh, his uh, player page that we created. Look at this. Um, Four-star on on three, but all everybody else has him as, as a three-star. Here's the issue, okay? is Does this sound like a three-star? Texas, Alabama, and A&M all offered him within two weeks after seeing him in the spring, okay? that's not what a th- That's not what a three-star sounds like. They saw him after basketball, saw him play in, in spring practice, and got after him. Jeff Bl- Jeff Banks included. So uh, take take that for what it's worth. Uh, really big believer in Jordan Washington. All right, Bobby. And I think you were going to say something before Washington. Go ahead. Oh well, I wanted to I wanted to circle back uh, on this and, and talk a little bit about what we're waiting on right now uh, because pe- so many people have joined us. Over a thousand more people have joined since we started. Ty Anthony Smith, uh, the linebacker out of Jasper, we're waiting on a decision from him. It could come early. It could come at 6.15 this afternoon. Can't, I mean, just that's the way it is. We can't mess with time. He, he, he's on his own timeline. We do think Texas has a real shot to flip him from Texas A&M. We're also waiting on Aaron Hampton, uh, the defensive back athlete out of uh, Dangerfield. Uh, right now, it looks like he is flipping to Alabama from Texas. This will be his, I think, fourth different commitment of the recruiting campaign. It's not a huge loss in the the Longhorns' uh, thought process, even though he is going to Alabama. uh, Texas really looks good at the defensive backfield. They look good at wide receiver. Uh, So if they're going to have somebody peel off, it would be somebody like Aaron Hampton, who right now doesn't have a home at either defensive back or wide receiver within those rooms. So we'll wait and see exactly what happens in the next – uh, hour or so, I think, uh, when we should find out more about Aaron Hampton. That's the update thus far. We're still waiting on Trey Moore, uh, the uh, portal prospect out of UTSA. Uh, he is expected to make a decision either today, tomorrow, sometime soon. Uh, I'm told before Christmas now, again, after being told yesterday that they thought it would be yesterday between Texas and Alabama. I Oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't add this. Nick Saban, I was told last night, Nick Saban drove Trey, Trey Moore to the Alabama football facility. After having breakfast at Nick Saban's house, he drove Trey Moore to the Alabama football facility in a Ferrari. So <laughs> have fun <laughs> with that, guys. That's that's part of the fun of recruiting, man. I love this. <laughs> uh, hey, guys, we got a super chat we need to knock out real quick from Michael Dutton. He says, Bobby, do you remember a more loaded back run or a more loaded running back room? I don't, but you have a handful of years on me. LOL, hook them. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I, I don't have that. I, um, I'm not so sure last year wasn't more loaded. I mean, in retrospect, I mean, you have 
two draft picks, one a first rounder, one a what, what was it, Roshan, a third or fourth rounder, CJ? Um, yeah, and then you had Jonathan Brooks waiting in the room. You know, that's pretty loaded. I don't know that they have a first round draft pick right now in the running back room unless CJ Baxter evolves into that. Um, so I would say the one thing I will add, though, is the depth at running back and the multiplicity or versatility of it. Uh, we talk, I, I love Trey Wisner, long term guys. I don't know what he's going to be, but he, he flashes every time he's on the field. Um, I loved what Jaden Blue has become this year. I love where Cedric Baxter and his body, when he's healthy, is going to trend. So I, I'm I'm a big believer in, in that sort of stuff. All right, and then we have a question, another question for you, Bobby. This one from our old friend, UT Boy. He says, do you feel like this class today is the best since 01? No. No, I don't. Um, and, and I'll say why. I think it's not the best as much as it is very similar to the these last three have been very, very similar to me. CJ mentioned this about 30 minutes ago. Um, they're attacking needs so well. It, it's like the secondary we just talked about. It. I mean, think about the guys they have in the secondary. Kobe Black, Xavier Phil Samin, Santana Wilson. I mean, those guys are extremely good. Wardell Mack extremely good, top 100 players when they have a need last year they needed linebacker they go out and get anthony hill and a bevy of guys right um when they have needs they are filling them like rock stars i mean i so so i, I feel like that's why i wouldn't say this class and, and and it's actually one of the things that makes me feel good about the university of texas overall it's kind of now spreading out right it's not these one, we have to hang our hats on this one class. And Mac Brown did that too, because he followed up 01 with a strong class in 02 and 03. It's it's that spreading out that makes you a perennial contender as opposed to a one hit wonder. And that's I, I don't know if what other people think of that, but that's that's where I'm at on it. Yeah, and I think, Bobby, real quick, I think a lot of his classes that we've seen so far under Sarkeesian are complementary of one another. You know, when you talk about needs, you know, there's one thing to stack up on on linebackers or DBs every single year. But when you look at it, that's, you know, it, it doesn't help the roster construction. And, you know, I think Texas is seeing that right now. Obviously, they're deep on uh, the, the defensive back room right now, whereas linebacker, you know, they're fighting for that one guy, Anthony Smith. And that's a result of taking five guys or, you know, four and a half guys, if you will. Uh, in the 2023 cycle. So it's not necessarily a, uh, a numbers game, but it's it, it's a true roster construction and ensuring that you'll always have the, the necessary depth and the necessary guys behind you uh, to, to, to be able to fill and continue a high level of play at each position across the field. Uh, we got another big one in, guys, as if they're not all big, but another big one in, Kobe Black. The corner out of Waco Connolly, four-star cornerback CJ, give us the rundown on Kobe Black. Man, I visited Waco Connolly probably the summer of Trey Wisner's junior year, uh, and and so that was the summer of Kobe Black's sophomore year. And you know the coaches just absolutely raved about him. He was one of those kids that you know it it was like if you don't know about him now, you need to. And sure enough, very soon after that, he was all over the place. You know. Texas came in and was immediately one of those those schools that had his interest. His brother Corey is over at Oklahoma State, and you know I know that there were some conversations about where he was going to head after this season as well. But with Kobe, I see a lot of versatility in the defensive back room, and I think that's been a common theme with a lot of the defensive backs that Texas has has recruited this cycle, especially. I mean, I, I would see Kobe Black and Jelani McDonald together at outside corner. Then they'd flip around to be wide receiver and quarterback the next drive. So it's a lot about the versatility of Kobe Black. He has experience playing back deep at safety. He has experience playing uh, in the nickel as well. With his size and athleticism, it's there's a, a whole bevy of things that you can do with him. Uh, it'll be interesting to see just how things fall. I, I like him as an outside corner, kind of those boundary guys. The Ryan Watts was pitched to him in his recruitment as well. Uh, and so that, that would make a whole lot of sense. But, again, the versatility will allow you to do a whole lot of things once he gets to campus. And once you really get an idea of 
what fits him best skill wise. So it was a big win for Kobe Black. And, and to be honest, it was one of the worst kept secrets in all of Texas recruiting that he uh, wanted to drag out his recruitment because I had his recruitment draft and, and uh, you know, tweets ready since he officially visited back in June, he was ready to roll. He was locked in and there really wasn't any uh, second thoughts once he uh, was ready to roll, uh, you know, and join the Texas class, but great addition to the class right there. And, a third Waco Connolly kid from the 2021 class joining uh, this Texas program with Jelani McDonald and Trey Wisner. A lot of talent from the Central Texas area that Texas is addressing and uh, is finally joining the program here. Uh, Bobby, go ahead. You're muted, Bobby. <laughs> it wasn't Thanks, me. I, I apologize. I'm going back and forth because I have to. I'm typing on the computer to put their names in the in the uh, scroll so everybody sees that. Uh, the great thing about Kobe Black guys. He's, he's an all-around player. Um, CJ, you mentioned he would make plays on defense, then turn around and go play wide receiver. He even ran the ball some for Connolly in yeah. sweeps and reverses, that sort of stuff. Um, when you see guys like that still making plays on both sides of the ball, that's where you go, yeah, okay. That, <laughs> we probably need to be recruiting him. He had scholarship offers from across the country, whether it was USC or Alabama or Michigan or Notre Dame, Ohio State everywhere in between, but Texas and he locked on together early in this process. And we talk about it all the time, CJ, players recruit players. Okay. If Trey Wisner and Jelani McDonald aren't having a good time at Texas and aren't, aren't having a positive impact, you think that young man is ending up at Texas right now? No, he's not. And that's what I mean by players recruit players. You have a program like Waco Connolly that is, I mean, Waco High used to be when I was when I was covering recruiting on the road and everything. Waco High had two or three guys every year, right? Well, that has moved to Waco Connolly now. That same uh, that group of players that are just littering uh, NFL, not NFL rosters as much as college football rosters. You mentioned Kobe's brother. That Waco High group now at Waco Connolly. You have to have good relationships across the board. You can't be this one and done and try to go in there. And so I, I just think it's it, it's a positive sign for Texas overall, guys, uh, that these guys are recruiting one another. It's happening at Duncanville. It's happening at DeSoto. Byron Murphy and Jonte Cook. If Byron Murphy is not having a great time at Texas, you think Jonte Cook's coming to Texas? I mean, that's that's the way it's working right now. And I think... Steve Sarkeesian's created this, and uh, uh, Texas is going to benefit from it. Yep. All right. Well, Kobe Black was a good, a big defensive back get, but another one that just came in, Wardell Mack. <laughs> Michael, that's funny, called in sick for this. Wardell Mack is on the board, guys, officially uh, out of Louisiana, the corner. CJ, give us the rundown. I think the biggest thing that stands out for Wardell Mack, and you see it there at six, six foot and a half, he hits above his weight. You know, there, there's tons in his his film and tons that we've seen, uh, you know, Wardell Mack and coverage really shoot towards the line of scrimmage and, and make a play on a ball carrier that has, you know, 20 or 30 pounds on him. And I think that's very encouraging. Uh, I've, I've mentioned it on Twitter a number of times this year. One of the most impressive things about Malik Muhammad is that physicalness, that drive towards the line of scrimmage to, to, to negate you know, yards after catch on screen plays, on dump downs, on underneath routes. When you have that physicality at the cornerback position, it helps your defense so much because we all know and are all aware dating back to this year's Red River shootout, just how, you know, unfortunate it can be at times when your cornerbacks on an island miss tackles. And so with Wardell, Wardell Mack, I think it's it's a guy who's not necessarily the biggest. He's a bit wiry, but he's not afraid to hit above his weight. And he's a guy that doesn't shy away from contact. And I will always take a cornerback that can tackle uh, anytime I can on my team. Because, again, if you're on an island and you don't have that help next to you, it's a big play waiting to happen. So big fan of Wardell Max. And, again, no, no team has, has benefited more from Florida's kind of really – Demise, yeah, yeah. <laughs> downfall, demise, destruction, <laughs> all the D words, right? <laughs> you can thank Corey Raymond no longer, uh, you know, being employed by Billy Napier over there for a number of for a number of guys, and 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 this is 
you know, a, a, a big reason, big addition to the class. And I think Texas fans are going to be very excited for what Wardell Mack will turn into eventually. You know Bobby, what I what? like about – I'm yeah. sorry, Blake. What no, I like I about asking. Wardell Mack, uh, CJ, and uh, Blake, I love his versatility. I think that you could play him at nickel. I think mm -hmm. he can spot at corner. I think he could play safety, free safety if you went – uh, especially if he went to a three safety look at times uh, he's willing to throw his body around like CJ talked about. And then I'm going to add this. I don't know that Texas took a single short arm DB this year. Yep. He's got those long arms uh, that, uh, you know, I look, Texas is going after a certain type in the secondary. There's no doubt. They got to be able to run and they got to have long arms. And I think they got to be able to cover. They're not going just for headhunters. They're not going just for for uh, co strict cover guys that, with speed. They're looking for versatile uh, guys across the board, in my opinion. Uh, one name that keeps coming up in the chat, guys, is Ryan Wingo, uh, the, the receiver out of Missouri. Can y'all give the latest? Maybe what you're feeling yeah. there. So, so long story short, Ryan Wingo is his. Uh, to my knowledge, his is not in yet. Uh, we're monitoring that. Uh, there are some thought that, hey, maybe he's looking at Missouri again because of this or that, uh, and it's coming down to the final minutes. Uh, but, I, look, I was told that he's uh, expected to be in this class, uh, and that's expected uh, still for, for us at this time. Could something happen, right? Could something happen? Of course. This is recruiting for a reason. It's not, you know, it's not tiddlywinks. <laughs> this, is a, this is a man v. man uh, when it comes to recruiting, so we'll see how – uh, the final signature goes, but I've been told everything was expected to go according to plan. Uh, I think CJ, you had some similar insight as well from your sources. Yeah. It, it you know, it, it's one of those things when you have a five-star guy from your hometown, you'd be a fool not to circle back around and give one last Hail Mary pitch to, and that's where Missouri is currently. And, and, and to Missouri's credit, you know, they've built a top 10 program this year. They've turned around what has been a, a, a really a, a consistent six and seven, 500 football team into being a top 10 program that is now attracting a whole lot of talent around the country. And it's making it to be a desirable place to play. And obviously what we've seen uh, this year with, you know, that, that receiving core and what they've done statistically, it's giving him some second thought. I've been told this morning, uh, Texas feels confident. There's a lot of confidence inside of Moncrief and there's, you know, confidence that that signature will come in today. So uh, at the moment, nothing I've heard has deterred me from believing that. And I do believe that Texas signature will come in uh, facts to the Moncrief facility sometime this afternoon. Uh, we got another one that's in, guys. Wide receiver Freddie DeBose out of Smithson Valley just played in the state title game where they lost to Alito. Um, and I'm going to let either one of you tell everybody out there about what he brings to the table for the Longhorns. Yeah, man, Freddie DuBose, it's unfortunate he went through a, a, a knee injury his the, the end of his junior year. But one thing that was very impressive with DuBose was his ability to get back on the field that quickly after an ACL injury. He was running routes at the Under Armour uh, All-American camp in Dallas six months after he tore his ACL. That's impressive. And he was running routes at full speed uh, in one-on-ones. Uh, so I, I do think there is a little bit of a twitch still with his knee, but it is something that over time should be able to come back from. Uh, and, and, and it's not like I – I, I see Freddie Dubose, you know, in a in a big role early on in his role. There is a lot of athleticism. He can fly high and he has good hands. You know, that's one of the things that we've talked about a lot. You know, not always with these receivers do you see the hands being something that are extended out to make contested catches. With Freddie, I see that he was used all over the offense at Smithson Valley. Uh, his vol, you know, volume rate. Of, of, of touches was outstanding for a wide receiver. Uh, they used them in the backfield, uh, jet sweeps, screen passes, going deep, everything that you could imagine in an offense to get him the ball, they found a way to do it. And, uh, I mean, uh, like we said about this wide receiver room, there is a lot to be excited about when you pair him up with uh, Parker Livingstone and, and Ryan Wingo. Uh, with all three of them, a lot of speed, and, and, and Freddie Dubose is a guy that can fly. I, I you know – this is uh, probably one of those that we're going to have to wait and see on, frankly, uh, because he did not come back great from the knee injury. He still looks like he's still a little, um, you know, he's still favoring it, frankly. Yep. Uh, if if you would have told me before 
that knee injury, Texas got a, a signee from, from Freddie DeBose. Would you take it? The answer is heck yeah. He yep. was one of the most explosive players, not just in Texas, but in the country. Plus, he has great size, great ball skills, et cetera. I think that he needs to take six months off and really rehab. It's not unlike Isaiah Nayor, who I think tried to push it too quickly on his injury rehab, right, and never really got all the way back. So, look, get get CJ Vogue, or get CJ, get Freddie Debose in, and let him try to figure it out and get him the right amount of rest and the right amount of reps. And I think a year from now, you could be talking about Texas with one of the better receivers in the 2024 class. All right, so we're going to take a couple of quick questions while we wait uh, for the next one to go on here. And Gage Sheet says, anything going on with Solomon Williams? I know there was some chatter this morning there about Alabama really making a strong push. What are you guys hearing from the Texas side of things? Uh, Texas has not been pushing for Solomon Williams since late last week when Trey Moore entered the picture. Uh, he is expected to sign with either A&M or Alabama today. Uh, Texas had one more spot for a potential edge. Uh, I think that they at that time decided, hey, let's go, let's go in on Trey Moore. Uh, we'll see if that happens for Texas, but I do not expect Texas uh, to sign Solomon Williams today. And then the next one here is from Art Torres, and he says, guys, who do y'all think will have an immediate impact on offense or defense their freshman year out of this recruiting class? Wow. Um, oh. I think the number one guy you can point to is Colin Simmons having some sort of rotational impact on that edge. I know Texas is having uh, a lot returning on the edge, and they're obviously in the market for another edge. But when you consider what Colin Simmons brings to the table with his production from high school and his athleticism off the edge, it, it's one of those guys that I could see easily penciled in to having a large role. Luckily, Bobby, we're in a spot now where Texas isn't necessarily needing a whole lot of production from this freshman class. You know, in years past, especially when Texas was struggling, you're looking at guys that were thrown into the fire immediately. And that was kind of one of the hindrances from allowing Texas to fully see what they were capable of uh, in the win loss column. Uh, I'm looking at guys now. I think it's, it's fair to write in Ryan Wingo, obviously with the void at receiver right now. Uh, and, I mentioned it last night in the stream with uh, with Aaron and, and Rod. I think it's unfair for Ryan Wingo to be penciled in as a starter, but I do think it's one of those things to say, hey, we're going to need athleticism and, and, and playmakers off at, at, at wide receiver right now. Ryan Wingo, if you're able to learn this offense quickly and adjust to the speed of college football, there's going to be room for you to get on the field very early. You know, it, this is a tough question uh, because I think part of it, Part of the answer relies on what Texas has coming back. Um, there's some part of me, CJ, that wants to say Xavier feels to me on defense. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think that people don't realize how much Texas is losing at safety. B.J. Allen, uh, Larry Turner Gooden, uh, Jalen Catalan, uh, uh, Jaron Thompson, Keaton Crawford. That's five. Five safeties. Some young guys going to have to play. Yeah. Um, so that would be one of my pieces on this. Um, as far as um, as far as the offensive side of the ball, I think you have to look at the receivers right now, um, whether it be Ryan Wingo, uh, Parker Livingstone, whoever is the most ready to go is mm -hmm. going to get some snaps, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I feel like Christian Clark is probably the most ready to go on offense at running back and running backs typically hit the field early. I don't know that Brandon Baker is going to be able to beat out somebody like Cam Williams at right tackle. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are a lot of picks. I will say this. There are more holes on defense right now outside of receiver on offense. And so my thought process there is who fits, who's the best chance to fit that hole. And whether that's, I mean, look, it could be Phil Samee. It could be Wardell Mack. I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I guess we got another one that just came in here. Jordan Johnson Rubel out of Fort Worth, of course, played for IMG Academy in Florida. CJ, what immediately jumps off to you, uh, you know, on his film about Rubel? You know, he's not a big guy. And, and similarly to uh, to Wardell Mack, it, it, he's one of those guys that really punches above his weight class. 
And, and I think that's exciting when you consider, you know, kind of the frame that he provides. You know, I, I think it's a it's a lazy take to to say, you know, a, a Texas DB that's only five, nine and a half or five, ten is comparable to Quandre Diggs. But, you know, that's kind of the, the physicality that I see. You know, he has the versatility of a of a PJ lock in the nickel as well. So uh, his recruitment was a fun one because, you know, he's from Fort Worth. He had ties to the DFW area. And then he departs for IMG Academy. And all of a sudden, it feels like, you know, there might not be as much of a hope or an inroad for Texas in this recruitment. Well, a surprise visit around spring break uh, in March back in, er, yeah, back in March this year, you know, kind of set the ball rolling here. And things really got moving in this recruitment again for JJR and Texas. And, you know, he wasn't shy about it uh, when I talked to him at the Under Armour camp up in Arlington. Uh, in April, he was saying, you know, I like what Texas brings to the table. I like the idea of coming back home and Texas, you know, they're, they're turning things around. And so he was one of those early adopters of, of the vision that Steve Sarkeesian and his staff had for this 2024 class. Sure enough, he's in this, into this class. And again, that summer official visit weekend, when it was Corian uh, Gibson and Kobe Black, who was in the mix? Who was in the middle of that? It was Jordan Johnson Rubel, and he was a big part of getting Texas to be where they were in this class, getting a lot of pieces uh, on board and, you know, seeing the vision uh, defensively. Bobby, you're Bobby, muted. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm, I'm not paying attention to it. Um, he's one of those guys I saw again uh, this year that I, I really liked because I think he is a team captain possibility. He, he has he strikes me as that type of guy speaking with the IMG coaches. Uh, they think he's one of the first guys on the practice field and one of the last ones to leave. Uh, he is hard nosed. He cares about football. It's very important to him. Um, I, to, to CJ's point, could he play nickel? Could he play safety? I think he's more of a true safety after having watched him in person. Uh, and if there is a downhill safety in this class, it's him. He likes to stick his nose in there a little bit, CJ. Um, and so um, I I could see a couple of different ideas here uh, for Texas. Uh, but uh, I, I like him because I think he's a mentality guy. I think he's a culture fit. Um, he's originally from Fort Worth, by the way. I, I don't know that you mentioned that or not, but ended up transferring to IMG a year ago uh, and spent his last two seasons there. Uh, he has been a Texas guy from the get-go. And I think that he's been a ringleader of the class. And if you talk to him, and we've had him on on Texas football before, if you talk to him, it's clear, it's clear that he gets and wants to be a great football player. And he will be he will be one of those guys that does whatever it takes to to maximize his ability, in my opinion. All right, guys, but well, you're watching the Coffee and Football Signing Day special brought to you by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. And, Bobby, I'm going to let you tell everybody out there about Adam Lowy and his law firm. Yeah, absolutely. Adam is a, 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 out of Austin. If you've been injured on the job or uh, in a car wreck, something catastrophic that just you know uh, probably deserves or at least needs to think about receiving some compensation for, Adam is who you want to call. He's been doing this for a couple of decades, 512 Two eight zero zero eight zero zero, or visit him at lowylawfirm.com. That's lowylawfirm.com. He gives you a free consultation, so there's no strings attached. Give him a shout. 512-280-0800, or visit him at lowylawfirm.com. Uh, we want to thank him for being a big sponsor of today's show. We got another one in, fellas. It, uh, <laughs> if I can bring it up here, DeAndre Robinson is now in the fold. CJ, go ahead. I'm very excited for DeAndre Robinson. And, and, and for it, it, it comes with a lot of reasons. Obviously, you see 6'3 and a half, 315. He's one of the – or he is the biggest interior defensive lineman in this class. Uh, and that comes with not a whole lot of development and fine-tuning at the high school ranks. Yet you see everybody except for 24-7 sports right here has him as a four-star prospect. So you see the potential. You see what a lot of people – or, or banking on right here. He's a physical guy. He uses his hands very well for an interior guy. And there was times this year at Jones where he was used on the edge. And I think that's encouraging to, to really see just how well he moves and gets after the passer at 315 pounds. 
I think that Texas is finding a true nose here. Uh, it's one of those things where I expect him to get up to about 325, 330, while trimming down on some of the bad bo body fat that comes with being that big in high school. You know, once you get into a college weight room, things are a little bit different. And uh, Bo Davis, once again, uh, being able to go into SEC country and fight off schools like Florida, uh, Ohio State was heavily after DeAndre Robinson as well, uh, you know, it says a lot about the vision that these recruits see from Bo Davis and, and kind of the development that they expect uh, upon entering the Texas program. So a uh, big fan of DeAndre Robinson. And, and really, once again, the, what really stands out about, upon watching his film is the physicality and, and the hands. That, that's really encouraging because I think that translates to the next level. Bobby? Well, I, I, look – if there is a Tavondre Sweat starter kit in this class, it's DeAndre Robinson. Um, he is 6'4", 315 pounds, and he hasn't seen college of weight room or college nutritionist yet. Right. That, I mean, so, and he has that level of athleticism. You can see it in the film. It's, it's obvious. Um, he needs to work harder. He needs to take – uh, football more seriously, probably all of those things, right. That you can say about any 17 or 18 year old guy. But I would, I would add that I think that he is one of those guys that has as high upside as any defensive lineman, not just in Texas, but or not just in the Texas sign, but in the country. He has, it's, he has that Tavondre sweat type of upside. So it's going to be out of Bo Davis, Steve Sarkeesian, Pete Kwiatkowski to get it out of you. But that's the kind of level that I'm talking about. Yep. You could see him being a first round pick if everything goes right. There's a lot, there's a lot to happen between today and four years from now, but that's the level of prospect we're talking about. And that's why I, I see CJ nodding his head earlier. That's why CJ's excited about him because you can see the raw material, right? I mean, that's 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 a big one. All right, we have a super chat we need to read real quick from Michael Dutton. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, we already read that one. Uh, from Rocky Poor. Sorry about that. Thank you, Rocky. He says, do you see Ryan Williams affecting what Texas does? Him changing to this year and opening up his recruiting, does Texas even have a chance? Well, you know, Auburn and Alabama are going to the mattresses on Ryan Williams. <laughs> I'll just, I'll put it that way. Uh, yeah. He's already visited Auburn where the student body chat chanted his name. His dad played at Auburn. He's been committed to Alabama uh, for, for almost a year now. So, I, look, I could see either or, uh, CJ and Blake, in, in this regard. Uh, I do think Texas is going to try to get a visit in January, but I don't know how serious a player Texas will become in that in, at that time point, right? Uh, so I, I would say that that is a remote chance. I would say 15 to 25% chance that Texas – uh, ends up really being a serious contender with Ryan Williams. He is a 2025 originally uh, recruit uh, from Sarah Land High School in Mobile, Alabama, that is a high school teammate of K.J. Lacey, who's committed to Texas, the quarterback. But I, I think that the pull there for him, and he's reclassified to 2024, I think the pull for him is really going to be hard to get him out of the state of Alabama. And then we have another super chat, this one from Michael Cluckhorn. And he says, super chat a dollar. Hit the subscribe for the work these guys put in for us. Hook them. Hey, Michael, we appreciate it. We appreciate everybody out there tuning in today. Going to already is an exciting day for the Longhorns, but it's National Signing Day, man. What more <laughs> could you ask for? <laughs> I love it, Blake. I, look, guys, so we'll have, we have, they've already got some more lined up that, that we're not announcing. We're waiting for, for them to announce uh, publicly. I, I want to say this. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, working with you guys uh, and wa and talking about Texas football this this season. I think it's been a special season for the Longhorns, uh, and I wouldn't want to spend it anywhere else. So thank you guys, and thank you, everyone. Uh, we got another one that's in, fellas, and this is a big one right here. Daniel Cruz, the offensive lineman out of North Richland Hills. CJ, go ahead and let everybody know about Daniel Cruz. You know, it's rare for – for offensive linemen in high school to see where they're projected at the next level and to immediately want to jump into that role as high schooler. And that's exactly what Daniel Cruz did. You know, he is that projected 
center in this class. You know, we talked about Nate Kibble out of the guard, Brandon Baker out out wide at tackle. Daniel Cruz is is through and through a center at the next level, and he went to his his coaching staff at Richland uh, Hills and, and and basically said, you know what, I see where I'm going to be at the next level. I want to get reps there. I want to see how I project and how I can develop and get ahead of the game, really. And that's exactly what he did. He has experience all across the offensive line. Uh, and, and again, you know, Bobby, we've mentioned this in the past, but when you talk about guys who are absolute maulers in the run game, this is the name that comes uh, first to this list that so far this season. He's a very, very fun guy to watch when it comes to finishing blocks, extending to the second level. And he will put, you know, anybody on their back, regardless of size, and he will let them know. He's one of those guys, and I love offensive linemen that play with a chip. Jake Majors had that coming out of Prosper back in his recruitment. And it's one of those things that, you know, if you're offensive linemen, you either play with that nastiness or you get beat. And and Daniel Cruz has that nastiness, and it's very encouraging because he's a super cerebral guy. He's a smart guy. Obviously, he made the decision himself to, to move towards the interior and play at center his senior season. He understands offenses, and that's exactly what you want to have, uh, cohesion between your quarterback and offensive line. That's your your quarterback of the offensive line right there moving forward. Um, look, here's what I would say about Daniel Cruz. Texas passed on Casey Poe out of mm-hmm. Lindale, uh, who they thought was a center. Alabama recruited him as a center. Texas recruited Daniel Cruz because they thought he was the best center prospect in the country. Not in Texas, the country. Um, and you know, frankly, he moved to center this year, uh, as a senior first time he'd ever played the position and he looked like he deserved to be the number one ranked center in the country. I mean, he took to it, uh, like a duck to water. So I feel like in, in you mentioned Jake majors and I think it's, it's, it's nice that we talk about Jake majors in this way because he has adapted to what Kyle flood wants because he's not the, the, the prototypical uh, SEC center, right? He is a more of a move around guy. He's not ta- he's not the guy you necessarily want anchoring against 350 pound defensive ends or defensive tackles, right? But Flood has molded him, and he's become he's he's made him, himself the best version of himself. Flood likes those guys that can withstand the 350 pound push. Well, Daniel Cruz can do that and push back. And that's what we are going to see in the SEC. So that's why Daniel Cruz was so important. That's why they're cross-training Cole Hudson at center. Those guys with those lower, lower, gra- lower, uh, what are you saying? Cent- lower center of gravity type guys, uh, CJ, that can still root, uh, root people out in the run game. That's what they liked so much about Daniel Cruz heading into the SEC and why he was – Frankly, I, I, I don't know if he was the overall number one offensive lineman on their board, but I know for darn sure he's who they who they pinpointed at center and said, we want you and you alone. Oklahoma did the same thing, and they're a pretty good judge of talent on the offensive line as well. Yep. All right, so we got another super chat that we're going to read here real quick from Chris Rodriguez. And Chris says, what do you all think about the fact that we have the highest percentage of blue chips at 82% in this class? Not surprising. I mean, Texas is Texas. Uh, it's different than what it's been. I mean, look, I, man, I, I've seen so many ups and downs of Texas football over the last 30, 35 years. <laughs> it's been, you know, it's been, a, a, I think people that are my age and older definitely can appreciate the good with the bad. Um, it, it is certainly starting to turn and has turned. I, I guess we should have seen it coming after five and seven and then moving to eight and five, now they're 12 and one. Uh, but w- to watch it transpire and uh, see it is, it, it, you know, you never know if it's actually going to happen. You can guess it's going to happen. Uh, but uh, right now that's what's going on at uh, plain as day. And that follows through to recruiting, right? I mean, Sark, I, I, if I underestimated anything when he joined Texas, okay. And I, and I'll, I'd say this to his, I tell it to his face. If I underestimated him for anything, it wasn't his play calling. I, I thought he was a, could be, you know, a master at that, having seen it. I didn't realize how good a recruiter he could be. And not just 
a one-on-one -on -one recruiter, but an overall recruiter. He could recruit you in different ways, in different categories. So if I underestimated the head coach at the University of Texas upon arrival, it's in that category. Yeah, Bobby, real quick to your point, the amount of recruits that I've spoken to that have really said Sarkisian is as hands-on as anybody in his recruitment is a testament to him and we're obviously reaping the rewards on a, on a day like today. Uh, very rarely do you see and hear just how involved a head coach is in positions that may not be the most glamorous, you know, and and and, it, and it's in all recruitments, you know, it's not necessarily – uh, just the five star, just the Colin Simmons or Anthony Hills of the world. You know, I, I, I remember hearing specifically from Parker Livingston. He said, you know, I sat back and I got on the phone with Sarkeesian. And I mean, he told me right away, I want you in this class. And even a guy who didn't commit to Texas or sign with Texas, Selman Bridges, you know, the six four cornerback out of Lake Belton. He had a time where he he told me in the summer, he was like, yeah, I, I've faced Thomas Sarkeesian probably five times this week. It was Wednesday when I spoke with him. I mean, it just goes to show how in involved he is and how much he cares about uh, building the classes he wants, you know, in, in the way that he wants it to be. So uh, credits to Sarkeesian, credits to his staff. We've said it time and time again. You know, on a day like today, you really get to see just how special of a class that they have built over the last, you know, year plus. All right, y'all, we got a new one that's in. This is a guy that impressed me. One of the most impressive guys, in my opinion, in the state title games last week. Alex January, the defensive lineman out of Duncanville. CJ, give us your thoughts on January. Yeah, big boy, 6'5", 320. Uh, there is room to, uh, you know, kind of tighten up the body. He comes from, a, a you know, a, a pedigree of, of a, a former Longhorn legacy with his dad playing uh, defensive line back in the day as well. So the athleticism is there. I think, you know, playing on that off or defensive line with Colin Simmons, you get uh, overshadowed a good bit. And I, I, I want to go back to the, the Byron Murphy recruitment because that's kind of how, you know, I, I see this one shaping out for Alex January, not in the same sense that they're, they play the same play style or anything like that. But at the time, Texas was, you know, when Texas landed Byron Murphy, it was seen as a consolation prize for Shamar uh, Turner at the time at DeSoto. For Alex January, he's kind of in that same realm of being a little bit undershadowed or, you know, overshadowed. It, it, people are sleeping on him a little bit. And we saw the fumble recovery in, or forced fumble in the state championship. He was in the backfield continuously all day long. And there's a lot to like as a, as a multi-sport athlete, as a guy that has great athleticism for that size. We know what Bo Davis can do with, with heavy set uh, defensive linemen in this Texas defense. And January is a guy that uh, – like DeAndre Robinson can make that next step into being, you know, a really dominant force in that interior. Uh, the athleticism, I would say, for January is something that is a strength. Uh, obviously, being a two-ton state champion at or at Duncanville plays a big factor into uh, not only the mindset that he will bring as a true freshman to Texas, but also the work ethic as well. And I think, you know, again, if there's one guy that will get a defensive lineman right, it's Bo Davis. I love this. I love it. Um, you know, look, how often do you hear of a six foot five, 300 pound first baseman, um, that's good at baseball. I mean, seriously, I mean, I'm not trying to, um, it's a, that's a rare skill set for a big guy that loves to play football. Um, you, you talk about it. And I think that I, I talked to Mike January, his dad, who Mike, by the way, played at Texas. Um, I, I talked to, to him about it and the thing that he said that, that, my, that Alex had done really well over the last year was use his hands extremely well. And I saw that firsthand in the state championships on Saturday night or Saturday afternoon. He really, really was getting after people and into their pads with his push and then getting off of them using his hands. Um, and so even though DeAndre Robinson may be rated higher, right? Even though uh, there may be other players at Duncanville, to your point, that overshadow him, don't don't take this young man for for uh, for granted. Because I think of all the freshmen uh, on the defensive line, he's more ready than DeAndre Robinson. So he may be more ready than Sadir Mitchell. My opinion. Now he's I not. Like that. Yeah, he's not he's not 350 like Sadir Mitchell, 
But of all of those guys, if you're looking for a depth piece immediately, I, I think I think Alex January might be that guy. And that's when y'all asked me the underrated recruit in this class. That's why I, I pointed to, to Alex January first and foremost. Yeah, uh, Blake, real quick, because I know we just got another one. A quick story on Alex January. Uh, he visited in the, in the summertime, and as he was meeting with some of us uh, reporters, the reporter scrum outside of, of DKR, you know, he was he had just done his interview. He's standing back, and he's taking practice hacks. And I, I look at him, I'm like, all right, so baseball player, let's talk about it. He goes, man, I, I really love baseball. I love being out on the field, and he's, he's wearing his shades. I'm like, I'm like are, do you hit bombs? Like, is that what you do? And he goes, he's like, come on, man. I'm 300 pounds. Of course, that's what I do. Like, all right, well, I've got a bat and a tennis ball in my car. I can bring that out and I'll, I'll throw you three pitches and let's see what you do. We're in the parking lot, you know, right outside the LBJ library. I think he hit it halfway up there. I mean, he clobbered me and I had to turn around and run after it. So it didn't hit a car or anything in the parking lot. But that just goes to show, you know, the hand eye is there. The athleticism is there to be a multi-sport athlete. And that's one of my favorite stories from uh, this recruiting cycle because, again, it's very rare that you see a 325 pounder, uh, you know, rounding the bases like like that. So, uh, a fun story that I'll hold on to, and I'm glad I was able to share on a day like today. You know, one that we'll reflect back on and and get to celebrate moving forward. Hey, I've got to ask you, just talking about celebrating. I know we got another player coming. I see your little Nokia shirt there. Is that the Nokia Sugar Bowl? Uh, shirt by chance it is <laughs> it is <laughs> i it saw is. that i was like why is he have a nokia shirt on and then i looked and i saw the the cup uh, alongside it cj that's awesome dude I, I told you yesterday all i had to do was do some laundry and i would get back into the end of the room you know <laughs> all right bobby we got another one in as you said and it's one i know that you're very very excited about about that's christian clark you're very high on this kid the running back out of mountain point in phoenix Tell everybody why you're so high on Christian Clark, Bobby. Um, absolutely. Uh, he's got a toughness to him. We talked about earlier about what I think Tashard Choice really tries to find in his running back room. I think he self-selects for toughness first and foremost. Doesn't matter your size, your height, your weight. Self-selects for toughness and then sees if you have elite traits in some capacity. Because there are so many, as we all know, in football, there are so many different ways to be an elite running back, right? But you can't self-select for toughness. You can't make a a a, a weak running back strong. It's just not it, – it, that, that doesn't happen, guys. Um, and so Christian Clark is a guy that played linebacker. I had, I don't know, 50-plus tackles as a high school junior, split time at running back. Texas loved him. He was injured early in the year. Uh, Texas loved him so much. Uh, that they just totally disregarded all in-state running backs to go after Christian Clark. You know, and Texas uh, has hit pay dirt in Arizona once before with a running back. Uh, and so I, I'm, I am one of those guys that it, it, Lee is, is led to believe that Tashard Choice knows what he's doing uh, in, in the recruiting realm here. Uh, I like his quickness in the hole. He can make people miss going laterally. He, people bounce off of him. He attacks defenders sometimes. He's just a he's one of those full-fledged running backs that I think can do it all. Has great hands, by the way. Great all-around athlete. Um, he fits to shard choice. He fits Steve Sarkeesian. I, I think this is one of the unsung players in this recruiting class. CJ. Like, there you go. Yeah. No, a hundred percent. I mean. It, again, I, I mentioned it earlier, but when you talk about the last time Texas went to Arizona for a running back, it worked out pretty well. Uh, Christian Clark, I, I think, is in the conversation for being the most talented running back in the country. Uh, I think whenever you kind of add what he brings physically and the, the vision, the, the, the feet uh, and the power to, to not only run through you, but to run past you as well. Uh, it's it's very encouraging to get him in the same room with the shard choice just to see you know, how his play can be elevated because with the short choice, that's all we've seen so far with his running backs. You know, he has two first round running backs under his belt. He has elevated the play of, uh, of Roshan Johnson into being a fourth round guy. Uh, it, it, we've obviously seen what Jonathan Brooks and Jaden Blue and, you know, even Keelan Robinson at times have done this year. So uh, very encouraging, very exciting. Uh, Christian Clark, like you said, Bobby, is one of my favorites in the class. And 
you know, I, I cannot wait to see him get a, a year under his belt and really take the reins, you know, moving forward into the SEC. I, I love the pickup. I, I really do, guys. I um, circle and, and circle and underline him, in my opinion. Circle and underline him. All right, let's let's uh, re rehash a little bit here, Blake. Yeah. We need to. People have joined us. Uh, we're waiting on the decision of Aaron Hampton out of Dangerfield. We believe he is getting ready to flip to Alabama. Uh, he's been committed to Texas as an athlete, uh, both wide receiver and defensive back. Uh, Alabama recruiting him specifically for uh, wide receiver. We think that could be uh, the uh, thing that tilts it in the favor of uh, of uh, the, the Crimson Tide at this point. We're also waiting on a decision from Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker out of Jasper. He has not announced his decision yet. He's not expected to until 6.15 tonight. Uh, will that change and actually word get out beforehand? That's what often happens. Uh, we'll see, though, if that happens. Also, uh, waiting on uh, uh, Trey Moore, the edge prospect out of UTSA, a, a, a portal transfer. He may or may not decide later today. Uh, we'll be on, on top of that. Uh, overall, nationally, one of the things that's happening, in, or actually statewide, one of the things that's happening in Texas right now, there's a little bit of a barroom fight for Willis quarterback, Derek Lagway, uh, a five-star prospect who's been committed to uh, Florida for the longest. Texas A&M made a late push there, but it looks like the Aggies are going to finish either. Probably it looks like they're going to finish third. Uh, USC um, looks like they may be a team. <coughs> oh, boy. Yeah, you're good, Bobby. A team that they may be uh, fighting to the end here for uh, Derek Lagway. So a lot of stuff going on right now. Texas trying to roll off their commitments uh, and remain a top five class. All right, guys, uh, as we just alluded to, Santana Wilson is now in officially. And, CJ, I'm going to let you tell everybody out there about Santana Wilson. Our apologies, we don't have his player card up. But here's a look at his profile, the corner out of Desert Mountain. Yeah, he was one of the early evaluations and takes for, you know, the Texas uh, Texas DB room this cycle. And for good reason. I mean, I, I, I love the idea of taking defensive backs that have, uh, you know, uh, NFL pedigree and his father, you know, played for the, the Arizona Cardinals for 12 years, eventually moved into the executive in an, an executive role with the with the Cardinals as well. So football is all Santana Wilson has known, all that he's been around and been really, you know, a part of his life since he's been born. So very excited for that. For defensive backs, you love it whenever you your your guys back there understand, you know, scheme, zone coverages, route concepts. That's been embedded in him for forever. And to get, you know, a cerebral guy back into that fold, uh, it's very exciting. Santana Wilson, another guy that, Bobby, you've mentioned this earlier in the stream, Texas has targeted defensive backs this year with very lengthy, you know, wiry arms. And that's exactly what Santana Wilson brings uh, with his skill set. You combine that with the athleticism and the pedigree. I mean, it's hard to build a better cornerback than what you're getting right now with Santana Wilson. I think you have the flexibility to play him out wide or in the slot as well uh, with the out wide kind of field cornerback uh, as the most likely position for him uh, in his Texas career. So big fan of his. I had him as one of my three you know, sleeper recruits in this class. It's a, it's a great defensive back class. And uh, Wilson is just another guy that, you know, projects to be a, a, a you know a multi-year contributor for texas you know during his time on the 40 acres i i like to pick two i'll i'll say this uh i i i really like it um and the reason i like it guys is has more to do with texas adding uh more i, I want to say this the right way um overall intelligence football iq to the, to the locker room, right? That's when, when you start talking about a guy whose dad played, what, 12 years in the NFL, um, has been around ball that long, uh, is now an executive, I believe, in the Panthers organization at the NFL level. Um, you start adding those kind of guys that have the the elite traits. You talked about the long arms. You add guys that that can run. Um, you, just, you just look around, and that's the kind of guys you want in the locker room. They know how it's supposed to look. 
Um, and it's another one of those things that I think Steve Sarkeesian and his group are doing. It's it's molding this team in their image and how they see it. Uh, and uh, Terry Joseph went early on him, CJ. There was there was like, who is this guy? Some people thought, oh, he might end up one place or another. But no, he ended up at Texas. And I also think it says it speaks a lot about Terry Joseph at, as a cornerbacks coach that you have a NFL executive saying, okay, let's go with Texas, right, as opposed to somebody else. Furthermore, it, you look at it on top of Chet Brooks and his son Terrence Brooks being a starter in corner at Texas as well. He's a former NFL guy that put his trust in his family's future in Terry Joseph's hand. I think it's a big pickup for uh, Terry Joseph and, and uh, you know, an endorsement of sorts that uh, people maybe don't re recognize off the top of the head. All right, so we're going to take some questions here while we continue to wait. You're watching the Coffee and Football National Signing Day Special brought to you by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. And uh, the, here's a question that's been asked a few times, Bobby. Hopefully you have the answer for this. Menu 2 Sports says, what time is Sark expected to address the media today? I'm actually going to let uh, let CJ take that because he's going to be there. CJ, when, when is <laughs> when is the uh, when is the press conference today? Uh, the, I, I'm excited to be there. It's one of my favorite press conferences. Uh, he'll be speaking around three. What is it? Three thirty um, this afternoon. So I'll be up there, you know, providing coverage and updates. And and man, it, it, it's fun to finally hear the head coach, you know, who's recruited these guys for years you know, a year plus in most instances, be able to talk about them because, you know, it gives you insight into what they see, into how they feel that these guys fit into the program. And, you know, it, it's kind of a, a a peek behind the curtain, if you will. I know that's kind of our job as well to kind of, you know, peel back why these recruitments fell the way they did or kind of give you insight behind the scenes. But to hear it from the guy who made the decisions to allow, you know, this class to come together, that's something that's always exciting to me. So 3.30, uh, again, I'll be tuning in, hopefully, Bobby, uh, around 4 o'clock, uh, right after the press conference on the live stream, give some updates, see how things went, and, and, and just continue to provide updates in this way. So I'm excited. Hey, guys, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but Texas, of the 21 commitments, we've now got 19 signatures yep. in. Is that correct? CJ, go down the list of everybody that's signed thus far for folks. Yeah, absolutely. We'll start in – you know, the order that I was like going through often, starting from the quarterback down to the safeties and defensive backs. Trey Owens is in. Uh, the quarterback of the class, he is in. Uh, Cypress Fair, 6'5", whatever. You'll see it all right there. Uh, the running backs, both of them signed as well. Christian Clark, Jarek Gibson. Jarek Gibson was actually the first commit uh, – the, the first signee of the day uh, so far this afternoon. Obviously, being on the East Coast out in Florida helps that cause – uh, at the wide receiver position, Parker Livingstone and Freddie DuBose, the two Texas kids are in. We are still waiting on the signature from Ryan Wingo, the five-star out of St. Louis, uh, for him to come into the class as well. Jordan Washington, the tight end down out of Langham Creek, basketball background, 6'4", big body, loves the physicality out of him as well. He's in the class. Headed towards the off or the offensive line, the only one that – only signature that remains uh, – you know, out in the fold right now is Brandon Baker out of modern day in California. Daniel Cruz is in the fold. Nate Kibble's signature has arrived as well. The guard and center of the class are in and officially Longhorns. Headed to the defensive line, Bo Davis went three for three with signatures this, this morning and got them all relatively early in the morning as well. I know it's only nine o'clock, but man, it feels like we've been up here for, uh, you know, quite a while now. Melvin Hills is in the in the book. DeAndre Robinson and Alex January, uh, three really talented prospects, all with great size and athleticism. All three are Longhorns. Sticking with the, the Duncanville uh, side of things, Colin Simmons, the five-star edge, in the book. He's good to go officially a Texas Longhorn. And then uh, Zena uh, – Zena's in the book as well. Brother of uh, younger brother of NATO, uh, Uma Zulu is in the book. Uh, Texas is is clearing uh, five for five right now on the defensive line, and then headed to the defensive back room. We're still waiting what Ty Anthony Smith will do this evening at the linebacker position. But I mean, the defensive backs five for five signatures are in uh, in terms of Santana Wilson. He's in the in the class. Kobe Black, uh, the recent commit. Out of Waco, he is in Wardell Mack. Uh, we've recently talked about him 
uh, out of Louisiana. Jordan Johnson Rubel has signed and is in. And then uh, the five-star recent Florida commit, Xavier Filsami, is uh, uh, is in. And, and t- man, 19 of 21. We're, again, only awaiting uh, the outstanding NIL or NLI signees and, uh, you know, faxes from Ryan Wingo and Brandon Baker right now. We should have those in shortly. Again, Missouri's making a late push for Ryan Wingo. There is confidence on the Texas side of things. And, and like I mentioned earlier in the stream, I am expecting a signature to come through. Uh, for the Texas Longhorns. We're double checking on that behind the scenes right now too, by the way, guys. Uh, the one, a couple players you didn't mention, Christian Clark, but just to, he's in as well, uh, CJ. And then the mm-hmm. other one uh, that we're waiting on, Brandon Baker uh, out of uh, Santa Ana Mater Day. Guys, uh, Aaron Hampton, we're waiting on that as well. We did not mention him. Right now, we believe he's possibly flipping to Alabama. We will see if that happens. Uh, whether or not the young man from Dangerfield who had committed to Baylor, then committed to Texas, then looked around every other place, almost committed to Alabama again, then committed to Texas. <laughs> this uh, That commitment and, and that recruitment has been all over the map from the outset. Uh, he could be peeling off here and going to Alabama at the very last minute. Alabama recruiting him exclusively as a wide receiver, whereas Texas was recruiting him as an all-around athlete. Uh, the class right now overall ranks in the top five. Blake, do you mind putting up uh, the yeah. national rankings for Texas at this point? I uh, uh, got it right here, Bobby. You bear with me. And I, here we go. Oh, sorry, guys. As you can see, Texas at number five, Bobby. Yeah, number five currently in the on-three consensus rankings. Georgia one, Alabama two, Ohio State three, Florida State four, uh, the, the Longhorns with three five-star commits tied uh, with Alabama for the second most of anybody. Ohio State with four. Longhorns with 22 commits. That could peel back to 21 with the loss of Hampton, but perhaps improve to 20 back to 22 with Ty, Ty, Ty Anthony Smith. One of the things I want to mention here uh, as we move forward uh, is this. A uh, couple of things. One is that I still think Texas could add Ty Anthony Smith to this class. They're still recruiting guys in the portal, so we're still monitoring that. Trey Moore, one of them. The second piece of it is this. Of these 21 guys, Texas has 15 or 16 that are early enrollees. These are guys that are going to be on campus in a week, two weeks, when the, or three weeks when the spring semester starts at Texas. Mm-hmm. So this isn't – like usually you have to wait to see three quarters of the class or at least half the class before you know what you get in fall camp. Guys, 75% or so are going to be in Austin starting in January. We're going to see them and what they look like in spring ball. I I think that's imperative and and important uh, right now for the Longhorns. All right, we, we're going to go back to Ty Anthony Smith for just a second because we have a super chat on that from the Everything Show. And thank you for the super chat. He says, or they say, is Ty Anthony Smith signing today? Can y'all give the details on when that's going to be? Yep, 6.15, 6.30, right in that time frame later tonight. Uh, that is when we are expecting a final decision and signature from Ty Anthony Smith. Again, he's been one of those guys that we've talked about over the last week. Kind of you know, where Texas fits, it does feel like there's a lot of confidence coming out of Texas. I've been told there's a lot of confidence coming out of the Texas side of things. Uh, obviously, the recent visit, the the high of being on campus is still there. Uh, and, and again, if the word I've gotten the last month is, should Texas get Ty Anthony Smith on campus, watch out. And so uh, that's where we are at now. The decision comes down to Ty Anthony Smith, and we'll see this evening around 6.15, 6.30. You know, they're going to they're going to write articles. So I want to add this. They're going to write articles later today and tomorrow about biggest winners and biggest losers of signing day. CJ, you just wrote me and said that the big defensive lineman uh, out of Florida that is not going to sign with Florida today. Florida has to be the biggest loser They're, they're They've not only lost three guys to Texas in Wardell Mack, Xavier Filsamy and Jarrett Gibson. They've lost guys to Alabama, Florida State. Um, they're in the process potentially of losing the guy that kind of has been their linchpin of their class, the quarterback out of Willis, Derek yep. Lackway. Uh, uh, you know, like I said, there's going to be winners and losers in this. Uh, and I, I think that Texas is clearly going to be a winner today. 
Uh, Florida, a loser, I think A&M uh, potentially headed that way. By the way, I forgot to mention uh, uh, one of the things that happened in the portal last night uh, that we have not talked about. Fadil Diggs, the big defensive end, has committed to Syracuse uh, out of A&M. That, that recruiting class and, that, and A&M right now is just – it's a turnstile. I mean, Evan Stewart entered the portal yesterday officially, the wide receiver. Walter Nolan's in the portal. There are more guys uh, that we just don't know what's going to happen there, but it's pretty clear uh, right now that uh, that uh, there's an uh, exodus from College Station. Uh, it also appears that uh, our friends in, in Gainesville, Florida, that's not going real well for Billy Napier and his crew right now either. Yeah, Bobby, real quick, if I can touch on that, the uh... – you know, I, I do agree. T Florida and Texas A&M are probably the two teams that have lost signing day the most so far. To Texas A&M's credit, they went through a coaching change. You know, they had to kind of revamp their entire coaching roster. There, There is a lot of turnover right now in that, you know, administration and, and coaching room. That's not necessarily the case with Billy Napier. Obviously, the departure of Billy uh, – of, of Corey Raymond – you know, basically gifted Texas two of their defensive back members in this class. But, you know, the head man is still there. And that kind of goes to show just how, I guess, little confidence there is currently uh, around the Florida program. But talking to that point about Texas A&M's all-time number one class, because it it is being hit hard by portal transfers. Obviously, Evan Stewart, the most recent to enter the portal uh, we saw last night. Of the 12 – Highest commits in that class, eight of them have found new homes or are going to find new homes. Obviously, Walter Nolan and Evan Stewart, the two outstanding portalers uh, uh, atop of that class right now. So eight of the 12 that we continue to hear month and month and month again about how special and how historic that class was. They've only got four of their top 12 guys that are planning on suiting up for the Aggies when Texas plays them next year. And I, I was looking at that list last night, uh, CJ, and, and just talking to you about it as part of this whole process. It was very interesting in looking at that list uh, that, you know, a couple of them, uh, Connor Wigman's been injured, right? Mm -hmm. Anai White hasn't necessarily been as good as expected. Uh, Malik Silla, not necessarily as, as good as expected. Uh, Donovan, and then Donovan Stewart, Green injury. Donovan Green injury. Shamar Stewart. You know, you look at it, and there that that class is peeled off. That's what Texas is and and Steve Sarkeesian has done a good job of thus far with his two highly ranked recruiting classes. There hasn't been a lot of guys with attrition to the portal at this point in the twenty one class and the twenty two class, uh, and or excuse me, the twenty two class, twenty three class, and now the twenty four class. The the leftover class from Tom Herman when he took over there that has seen some attrition for Texas some serious attrition. But the ones that Steve Sarkeesian actually brought in have not seen much attrition at all comparatively. All right, guys, we, you're watching the Coffee and Football Signing Day special brought to you by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. And let's take a couple of questions. Uh, Brandon Simmons wants to know, any chance we get a surprise today? Well, I mean, there, there's a there's a possibility that Dominic McKinley out of Lafayette, Louisiana, makes a, an, an early decision. But e even though his mom and Dominic have both said publicly that he expects now to sign in February, uh, the next signing period is February 7th, by the way. Um, but uh, McKinley could sign with A&M today. He could sign with LSU today. He could sign with Texas today. He's hosted all three coaches, uh, all, co all three coaching staffs on uh official or on home visits in the past week, Syracuse, Elijah Robinson, the interim head coach at A&M, who is now going to be the uh, defense coordinator at Syracuse has been after him as well. Um, I think he's going to wait until next signing period though. Any, the other signing day surprises we're really waiting on are Aaron Hampton uh, and Ty Anthony Smith. Hampton expected to make a decision between Texas uh, and uh, Alabama. We think it's going to be Alabama at this time. We've seen stranger things, though. That could flip back to Texas before you know it. And then also uh, we're talking about uh, Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker out of Jasper, Texas. All right, this next question uh, from Cake Shaba 24 I hope I'm saying that right. He says, can someone explain blue chips to me? Is it like the top 300 recruits? 
how is that term or why is that term used? So it's it's actually something totally different. Um, so I'm a little bit of a historian on recruiting. I actually go back to I've interviewed guys like Joe Terranova who started this. I mean, I used to talk to Dave Campbell about it when Dave was still alive. Uh, and the guys at the Fort Worth Star Telegram started it in the Dallas. But all those guys back in the day that started this term blue chip uh, is actually back in the 60s, I think, uh, or late 50s. And what it was is they would pull recruiting coordinators, what they really were just assistant coaches at that time of all the major programs around the state of Texas. And they would pull them kind of secretively. And there would be a, like 11 to 12 guys statewide that would be considered blue chips. OK, that went on and started being used in other states, other places around the country. A blue chip, obviously the highest chip in a lot of poker, poker stakes games. Right. And so that's the vernacular. Uh, but ultimately, it's evolved into star rankings. I was one of the guys that I mean, I know this sounds kind of crazy, but I was in the room when people it was going to be diamonds. I know this sounds silly, guys, but when I first helped start Rivals, it was going to be diamonds. You're going to like the five diamond resort or whatever. You're going to be diamonds and diamonds looked really bad on the web. And so I said, well, what about stars? And they, oh, okay. Stars. And they look, put the stars in there and the yellow kind of popped. Right. And so we ended up with stars instead of diamonds back in, this is 19, I don't know, 98, 99, uh, 97, something like that. And so my point being uh, that that's kind of more, the term blue chip is more, uh, into a stars or five star now is is a, a more appropriate term. Uh, but what it really was back in the day is a guy that was the top eight to 10, 12 players in the state of Texas was a blue chip. Um, and you can extrapolate that out to Brandon Baker being a top 10 player in the state of California. Therefore, he's a blue chip. All right, guys, look, big news here. Five star is in the fold. Brandon Baker out of modern day in California. CJ, tell us about Baker. No, this is a big one. You know, you talk about, you know, the continual revolving door of five-star trenches. This is the next line of, of, you know, offensive linemen for, for Texas and Kyle Flood. Brandon Baker's exciting. The number one thing that stands out to me about Baker is his legs and just how, how well-versed he is with his feet and the athleticism with his lower body. Uh, to stick with quicker edge rushers out there in California, I mean, the, the strength is there. The size is there. Uh, it, again, uh, like you, you you talk about take and bake, uh, Bobby, and, you know, more times that applies to guys who might not be physically ready right now. With Baker, it's expected that, you know, his freshman year, he might not be that, that guy right away, and that's perfectly fine. That's almost preferable in the sense that you get a full year of weight room under his his belt. You allow him to sit back and truly study the game and get used to the speed of the game before he eventually moves to uh, to right tackle, which is where he is scheduled to be uh, upon his arrival at Texas. He will compete with Cam Williams next year for that spot. It's exciting. Again, you get these high blue chip caliber guys, as we've been talking about, on the offensive line, and they're true dis difference makers uh, when you head into a conference like the SEC. The legs, the feet, the drive, being able to push guys into the second level and run, uh, and run blocking, and and sticking with quicker, faster guys off the edge on the on, on pass protection is exciting. Uh, Brandon Baker, a true five star kind of guy, he is exciting. He is a guy that you know when you talk about NFL caliber guys, this is the top of the list on the offensive line. You know, I I, I met him briefly uh, in uh, at the five star elite camp that on three put on. Uh, this uh, summer, uh, he is every bit of his height and weight. I'll I'll, I'll verify that personally uh, for everybody. Um, he is uh, well spoken. Uh, he got up and spoke to a group as well uh, there and was talking to a couple of other players. Uh, he was originally thinking that he was going to go to either Ohio State, Georgia. He had mentioned Texas briefly. Nebraska was a possibility, uh, but about halfway through the recruiting process, it really seemed that. Kyle Flood and he struck a chord. I, I feel like that is why he's headed uh, to Austin. He's also, uh, I think, related to the Akana family uh, somewhat. Uh, and so that's a big uh, piece of the puzzle for Texas. Uh, Tassili Akana uh, and his, his family already Longhorns as well. Uh, and so that helped. 
Steve Sarkeesian's ties to California helped in this recruitment. Uh, Chris Jackson played at Santa Ana Mater Day, the wide receivers coach at Texas. That helped. Uh, all of these things are helping Texas uh, get into California. Last year, of course, they picked up DeAndre Moore and Spencer Shannon from California. Uh, Steve Sarkeesian's not going to stop recruiting the West Coast. Uh, that's where he's from originally. Yes, they're they're leaning heavier and heavier nowadays into uh, what I would call uh, leaning into the Southeastern Conference uh, area or footprint where they already have three commitments for next year. Uh, they got another one yesterday, Brandon Brown, a defensive lineman out of O'Galley, Florida, to add in Amory Winston uh, out of uh, Calhoun County, Georgia, and quarterback K.J. Lacey out of the Mobile area. So Texas is nationwide, is my point, uh, going from the West Coast to the East Coast and all parts in between. So uh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, big pickup there for the Longhorns. I think he's the most ready to go of the three offensive linemen. I don't know if he's the highest potential, though, because I love I love what Daniel Cruz and Nate Kibble also bring to the equation as well. All right, guys, we have a question here uh, from Horns7, and they ask, who are you mo the most excited about signing today? <sighs> Loaded question. I, I, there's uh, so many. Um, I'd say Colin Simmons. I, I, for... Look, you got to have guys that can change the game and disrupt the game, and so I would say him. I also think it's a it's putting the putting planting the flag in the ground, saying we're not going to let the best player in the state of Texas leave at a position where uh, other teams had. I mean, look, he LSU had pole position on him from from his freshman year, so Texas came in and beat them out, um, and. I feel strongly that that that's part of the reason why I'm, I'm really excited to see if he brings an Anthony Hill level impact to the Texas defense. CJ, what about you, buddy? Yeah, I'm going to flip over. And, you know, I, I, I love the, the raw tools that come with Orion Wingo, you know, and, and when you, you, you talk about, you know, playmakers in a Sarkeesian offense, and we've seen it for three years, you know, it makes a drastic difference and an immediate impact on a Texas offense. And and Wingo is the guy for me, just off of the raw physicality and tools and speed alone. You know, you can you can work on the fine tuning of aspects of running routes, of the nuances of of, of creating space. Something that when you watch the film, you don't see a a whole lot of at the moment. But thank, thankfully, Sarkeesian went out and got Chris Jackson, who really elevated that Jacksonville Jaguars, you know, wide receiver room to levels that we haven't seen and are struggling to see again since his departure. And that's why Trevor Lawrence is kind of looking, you know, uh, it's one of those reasons why Trevor Lawrence is is looking shaky in, in this year without him. That wide receiver room has undoubtedly taken a step back, even with the addition of Calvin Ridley. And so that gives me the confidence to say, hey, that development will be there for Texas wide receivers, as long as Chris Jackson is still employed by the University of Texas and Steve Sarkeesian. It's certainly encouraging. And Ryan Wingo, I mean, Bobby, that that film, I'm, I'm Blake, I'm sure you've watched as well. I mean, it's exciting to see, you know, just how physical he is, the gifted traits and, and talent that he has, just to get that little bit of, 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 of finesse, you know, in his game as well. I think he is a, a guy that has all conference written over him. You know, just as long as he can continue to take that next step forward once he gets to the 40 acres. Uh, it's it's important to note that he is the one that has not signed with Texas. Yep. Uh, and that's the final piece of this puzzle. Now, 20 of the 21, uh, 20 of the 22 commitments, uh, Aaron Hampton has not signed with Texas either. Uh, we're waiting to also hear on Ty, Ty Anthony Smith. Uh, I do believe that Ryan Wingo could be a special prospect at, at Texas as well. Rarely do we see a guy that big, CJ. Uh I rarely do you see him returning kicks and punts. I mean, a six foot three punt returner. When's the last time you heard of that? Hey, that's what has me so excited about Parker Livingstone. And again, if that makes anything that that we've talked about this wide receiving class so exciting, it's the versatility and it's the speed. You know, big body guys that can cut, that can you know juke and 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 cut on a dime. You know, basically change directions at the at the drop of a pen is exciting to me. And it, as a result of that. You open the playbook to 
any possible route combination, uh, you know, as long as they learn it. And that's the next step in their development once they get to the, to, to the 40 acres. But, uh, but man, those two guys are really exciting, and I, I'm looking forward to it. All right, y'all, we're going to take some more questions here. And um, going back to Brandon Baker, who, you know, we just got confirmation that he signed. Osmosis Jones says, is he an early enrollee? I believe so. I believe he's one of the guys that's coming in earlier. Yep. Is that 15 or 16? Does that make it 15 or 16? We need to check on that behind the scenes. CJ, why don't you uh, do some double, double, double check our math on the number of, uh, of uh, early enrollees. Uh, It is one of the pieces of the, of it. Go ahead, CJ. I I was going to say, I have a list up here and I'll, 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 uh, you know, share it here with you if you want. Um, I, I, it's not official, obviously, but this is the guys that I've had, you know, listed so far. Uh, Trey Owens, both running backs, Christian Clark and Jarrett Gibson. Uh, Ryan Wingo, Parker Livingston. So Freddie Dubose will not be uh, an early enrollee as far as I'm aware. He will be the one wide receiver that won't be coming in early at the turn of the semester. Jordan Washington is in as an early enrollee. And all three offensive linemen, we've talked about it. Uh, previously with how important it is to get these guys, you know, adjusted. It was one of the big statements in, the, in last year's cycle as well with Peyton Kirkland, uh, you know, uh, Andre uh, Kojo and Jaden Chapman as well. You know, these guys getting an early and really getting a test of what spring football is like. Very important in me, for, for my eyes. All three are in. Brandon Baker. Uh, uh, sorry, I have Nato Umi Ozulu on my list. Uh, that's not <laughs> the name. Probably Zena. <laughs> yeah, no, um, but Daniel Cruz is in that fold as well. Uh, defensive line, DeAndre Robinson and uh, Alex January, as well as Colin Simmons off the edge. Uh, someone to, to look for as well. The, Jordan Johnson, Rubel, uh, Kobe Bat- Black, and, uh, you know, the, the most recent Florida flip and five-star commit, uh, Xavier Filsani is in as well. Um, man, that's a lot, Bobby. And when you talk about the importance of getting guys on – campus early it it, it goes a long way to their development and understanding of the texas football program here's another thing that would happen to if ty anthony that's 15 total that you have of the 21 uh or 22 um that's 15 total if you add ty anthony smith to that group it becomes 16 so that's how many that we're talking about overall because he is a mid-year guy uh as well uh all right uh longhorns uh, guys, this has been an impressive recruiting class overall. I don't think there's any doubt about that uh, from our standpoint. Uh, I want to ask you guys, uh, you know, from from your perspective, Blake, and this is the first time you've covered recruiting, I guess four or five years, you've been following it, you used to uh, yeah. cover it for us uh, at uh, Horns 24-7. The question I have for you on it is, what were you most surprised by in this recruiting class, uh, walking back into this like you did, uh, with us here at Coffee and Football. Well, man, I, I really think it's more just how pay, I, patient they were and how well it paid off more than anything. You know, I mean, they went big game hunting. I know that that's what the Sark, you know, Sark used the term with you and you talked to him, Bobby, right here on On Texas Football. But that's that's exactly what they did, and it paid off for them in a huge way. And, I mean, that's what they've done the past two years as well. But, man, it you look at guys like Phil Sami, uh, you know, just things like that where they just kept at it, kept chipping away, hanging around the rim. And man, I mean, it, it paid dividends for them. And so I expected them to be patient, but I don't know that I was expecting them to, you know, really strike gold the way they did with this class. And, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just amazing some of the players that they have been here because. They were patient because they played the long game, you know, and it wasn't just give up and move on to the next one when that guy didn't maybe show enough interest right off the bat. So to me, that's the biggest thing. All right. Uh, hey, I, I want to add something. This I don't I don't I don't normally uh, take this this way, but is, is that CJ, in your opinion, one of the smart ways to deal with this? Like has his. It, it clearly is to me. The results speak for themselves. But when you first saw Sark do this, didn't you have some apprehension? I mean, like, 
you kind of had to second guess, like what are, what's going on here a little bit. And then finally the dominoes started following, falling with Kelvin Banks and Cam Williams. And then ever since then, it's felt like, you know what? Sark kind of knows what he's doing. Yeah. And I think that's what, it, it, in, in any relationship, you know, that trust builds over time. And the minute you start seeing results, I think, you know, it expedites the process of, of, of truly understanding what the vision is and, and what the process will be like in terms of, you know, one flipping recruitments and winning recruitments outright. And so uh, the 2022, you know, uh, class especially laid the, found, the, the ground, groundwork and foundation of what recruiting would be like under Texas. And, you know, Bobby, we talked about it with Xavier Worthy and how he was the first recruit under Steve Sarkeesian that kind of, again, it, it, it laid the foundation for the impact that these guys, uh, that they're recruiting to have an immediate impact and to really have that, you know, kind of initial drive to uh, get playmakers and difference makers on the field and in the program immediately. And so we're seeing it year and year again, and it should only provide confidence moving forward in 2025 and eventually 2026 that this will continue continually be the guy, uh, be the trend for Texas recruiting. I, I like it personally. I mean, I, that I just think that that sticking to your guns and not letting uh, others dictate what you want and who you want is huge, um, and it's paid off. It's paid dividends for Texas. Um, all right, let, let's talk a little bit more about uh, recruiting and and this class as a whole. Currently ranked top 50, uh, top five. Uh, by the on three consensus, uh, Texas uh, trying to uh, hold off some other teams that are possibly going to get some commitments today. Uh, Florida State, Alabama, Georgia, Ohio State, the other teams ahead of Longhorns uh, at this point. Uh, you look at this list, Georgia, we don't think is going to be passed by anybody uh, today. Alabama, even though they could pick up some more, still look at the total commits, guys, for Georgia. Uh, they have lost a lot of guys in the portal in the last month or so, uh, just not seeing their way to to playing time. So they're signing an extreme amount of players uh, today. Uh, Florida State clearly has more players. Ohio State, the only one whose average uh, is definitively better, or actually Alabama, Georgia, and Ohio State, the only team whose average commit rating is higher than Texas at this point. That's high cotton for the Longhorns overall. No doubt about it. And hey, I, Blake, Blake, I wanted to say this. You yeah. were doing a giveaway. This might be a good time as we wait for Ryan Wingo, Ty Anthony Smith, and some other things. Might be a good time for you to mention that giveaway that you have going on with the Colt McCoy signed football, I think it is, or helmet. Yeah, not only Colt McCoy, guys. Jordan Shipley as well. You can see it right there. You can head on over to Twitter. And there's two ways. You can double your chances. Uh, to win by subscribing to On Texas Football and then go retweet the tweet as well. And we're going to draw for that, uh, well, here in two days, Bobby. We'll be giving it away on Coffee and Football on Friday morning. But, yeah, double your chances of winning by subscribing to On Texas Football. You do have to retweet it first. And then we're going to draw on December 22nd, just in time for Christmas. Get you a little Christmas present for yourself or if you want to you know, give it away to somebody in the holiday, in the spirit of, of holiday giving, then you can do that as well. But it is signed by Colt McCoy, signed by Jordan Shipley. So good luck to everybody out there. Be sure to subscribe, retweet the tweet, and uh, we'll, we'll draw at the end of the show on Friday morning. All right, we got some more questions, guys, and obviously a lot of time to get your questions in, so please do so. Uh, but one, one, one person that we haven't, covered in a while or talked about in a while on this from hook them all day every day it says good morning gentlemen got in here late this morning what's the latest on trey moore i talked to trey's representation late yesterday uh and uh, as of right now he was deciding between texas and alabama uh texas made a a a great pitch to him uh alabama then followed that up this past weekend with a great pitch to him as well uh he's trying to figure out where he wants to go to school what it all means uh, he had not made his decision as of four o'clock or so yesterday when I last talked to them. Uh, but we'll see how that goes the rest of the way. Uh, I expect a decision either today or sometime within the week. I, I thought I was led to believe that it might be yesterday because he was really winnowing down and narrowing down that decision time frame. 
but we're now waiting into probably the Christmas timeframe at the very latest uh, for Trey Moore. Again, I think it's 50-50 Texas, Alabama. I would not put a crystal ball or whatever in for either team at this point. That That's my uh, general takeaway. I think it truly is a, uh, based on what I'm hearing behind the scenes, it's a 50, 50 proposition right now. And then we're going to go switch gears to Dominic McKinley. Jake Hester says, are the Longhorns still in play for McKinley? How many players will this class finish with? Well, right now the class is at 22 and, you know, we're, we're looking at a potential drop of one and a potential out of one today. So 22 is where we're sitting currently. I know Texas is in the market for another defensive lineman, whether that is Dominic McKinley, uh, Alex Foster, who re recently visited, or a potential, you know, turn back around out east to DeAlan Evans out of Pine Tree. So 23 is looking likely right now. I'm sure that there will be, you know, uh, one more round of evaluations uh, finally, before that 2024 20, uh, conclusion wraps up in February. So 23, 24 maximum. Uh, I believe 23 is likely, not including the portal additions as well. Uh, with, with Dominic McKinley specifically, the word has been that he won't sign with Texas A&M today. Uh, if he makes a decision at all uh, today, Texas is you know a sneaky team to look out for uh, for earning his signature. I'm of the belief we won't see a decision today. I think we will stretch this one out into February and that second signing day. But again, if a decision does come today, Texas is in that position to be the sneaky pick. Okay, guys, this next question here, while we're on the uh, subject of other players that or that Texas has looked at, but this one in the past, obviously, but Steve Sherlock says, what's the latest on Evan Stewart? Obviously he went into the portal last night. And uh, it's been a hot topic in the chat throughout the show so far. So I'm going to let one of y'all run that down. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know that Texas is going to push here. I mean, uh, the immediate thought is, oh, well, Texas is going to go after the, the, you know, a guy that, that can make plays like Evan Stewart. Uh, you know, I, I feel and I think that Texas may make a call or he may call Texas and they're going to take it. I don't see Texas doing anything, though, at this time. I, I will say that. I, I feel like it just may not be a fit culturally. I mean, Texas has, look, we've said it. Steve Sarkeesian has this thing on rails right now. Why do you want to get the train off the track? You don't. And he's being judicious. I, I said this a week ago, a week and a half ago when I wrote it. it. He is being extremely judicious, and that means in every way possible. That means getting the right people to join the program, that means adding the right pieces in the portal. Um, and I think it's evident that when a guy goes in the portal and Texas wants him, we all know it pretty quick. And there hasn't been this, you know, sudden rush to go after Evan Stewart. So uh, keep that in mind. Yeah, Bobby, I think that's the biggest point right there is we've known who Texas has wanted to pursue, and we've seen it immediately upon their entry, immediate visits to Texas, immediate interest. Uh, reciprocated interest is is something that we've seen seemingly the last two cycles when Texas has pursued guys in the portals. Uh, I'm not sure and I've not heard yet that Texas is going to fully go after Evan Stewart. I Again, I, I'm led to believe that, you know, that, that when that recruitment ended uh, in his high school days, you know, it, it, it didn't slam the door shut, but it sure didn't leave a whole lot of room for for, you know, a, a revisiting uh, to, to potentially happen down the road. So I, I would be a bit surprised if Texas went all the way in on Evan Stewart. But again, on paper, it makes sense. And, you know, if if there is a, a rekindling, it the fit makes sense. I have got a, a strange addition to this conversation. It's not football related, but I get uh, text from all different sports and stuff at Texas. Uh, Texas has picked up a transfer from Nebraska in women's <laughs> volleyball. Whit Whitney Lowenstein, uh, uh, who was the number one, uh, number two scorer for Nebraska, not this year, but last year, she sat out this season uh, due to the death of her father, uh, is transferring to Texas. Uh, she was their second leading scorer. Uh, it is interesting to me because the Nebraska coach in volleyball seems to be a little, you know, irked about it, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, he, he denigrated Texas for taking transfers uh, in volleyball recruiting. But here's the reality. 
his leading scorer this year was a transfer from Florida. So sour grapes, buddy. Uh, yep. Anyways, just just want to put that out there because I've gotten like two or three texts on this since we had Andrea Elliott, Jared Elliott's wife on the program earlier this week uh, before the Longhorns won the national championship on Sunday. Uh, Whitney Lowenstein, the number two um, uh, scorer for Nebraska two years ago, is transferring to the University of Texas. Uh, I get I, look, you got to get it out there. Texas had a great baseball recruiting class, too. I want to mention yep. that. Women's soccer apparently had a top five recruiting class. Like uh, A lot of good going on on the 40 acres right now uh, as we celebrate kind of this recruiting class with 20 of the uh, 22 commitments already signed today for the Texas Longhorns, 16 of which we believe will be early enrollees uh, for Texas. Uh, guys, let's talk a little bit more national recruiting, CJ. I want to get your take on how some other teams regionally are doing. Let's talk about OU for a second here. Uh, the Sooners, uh, long-term rivals of the Longhorns, of course. Brent Venables has Oklahoma off to a really good start, especially on the defensive line. It, has they Have they followed through with that after they had a really good season this year? Or what's, what's your take on Oklahoma's recruiting class at this point? Yo, no. I mean, the defensive line above any other position has been where Oklahoma has made their money in recruiting. And you look at it this year, obviously, Nigel Smith out of Melissa was highly coveted by a number of programs. Uh, I think Texas kind of faded away from that recruitment once they found their guys in the southeast uh, of the United or territory of the United States. So uh, that was one that originally Texas fans or, you know, kind of fans in the area thought would be a big regional battle. Oklahoma came away with and then Jaden Jackson. Uh, out of ING Academy was one that took an official visit to Texas uh, late in June, I believe. Um, he's in the fold. And, you know, you look back at what Oklahoma's building currently, it stems with that defensive line. And, you know, one of the guys that really stood out to me last year was PJ Adebowori, uh, the five star from, you know, outside the region just a bit. It, just a freakish length off the edge. Uh, his brother was actually drafted by the, Chicago, or the Indianapolis Colts, I believe, in the, the second or third round of the most recent draft. Six five six six, like legit off of that that edge that can bend and can move. He ran a uh, – his brother actually ran, I believe, a 4-5 at the, the combine, which was, you know, for an edge rusher, I believe the best in the entire draft. So uh, Oklahoma currently, I mean, they're doing the right things. Danny Okoye as well. Uh, in that 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 edge class was someone that Texas and Steve Sarkeesian was heavily interested in at the time in the summer. Um, and so that's the number one thing that stands out to me about Oklahoma's class. I think their recruiting speed at the receiver positions was pretty well. Obviously, Texas fans are familiar with Brennan Thompson and his departure up there. Um, Anthony Evans was a guy that they were heavily after as well before he flipped to Georgia. I'm looking at their class now. I, I do think Michael Hawkins is a talented prospect. Um, I think there's a lot of development still there, luckily for Oklahoma. Uh, if you want to go that route, you know, Jackson Arnold does seem to have that position locked up uh, for the next couple of years. So I do like what they're building. Uh, it is a it's a strong class. And, you know, it, it will be interesting to see, you know, just how much they're able to build on the back end of that of that defense right now to compete with a Texas offense that is as high flying as we've, you know, grown a, a couple years ago. You know, David Stone, uh, Nigel Smith, you know, Danny Okoye, that's a good start, in my opinion, right now for Oklahoma's defense. Hey, CJ, I, I, we talk about all this stuff as, as much as we can and uh, kind of go over it. Uh, we haven't talked much about the SEC as a whole. Uh, LSU, Oklahoma, A and M, uh, all with, with I mean LSU with a good recruiting class, no doubt, right? Yep. Uh, we look at that. You look down here. OU had a top top is at a top ten class. Tennessee at thirteen, A and M at fourteen. Keep rolling down that list, and you'll notice guys uh, that Ole Miss at nineteen, South Carolina. Who would think that South Carolina has a top twenty class? Missouri at 23, Kentucky at 25. That that's where these these teams and even Arkansas at 27 and Mississippi State at 28. That's the difference in the depth. I mean, Mississippi State with a higher ranked class than TCU. That that's where people need to understand the depth of talent changes once we enter the in, the SEC. 
every weekend is a little bit of a battle one way or another, right? And I think that that's really what people are looking at overall uh, right now is trying to figure out how does this Texas team stack up against the LSUs of the world, the Alabamas, the Georgias, uh, the teams that have dominated that conference over a period of time. And Auburn having a horrible year on, on the field, Florida not even having a great year on the field, but still in the top 10 in recruiting. It, 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 Texas is entering a new realm right now, I think, with the SEC. And so when we talk about Oklahoma, it's not just Oklahoma anymore that Texas has to be on the lookout for in recruiting. It has to be the A&Ms, the LSUs. Those are going to be the new teams that Texas needs to worry about uh, winning uh, in the in the SEC, along with the Alabamas and Georgias, who are, have been there for a while now. Yeah, and what's not mentioned there is the work that these schools do in the portal. You know, we, we, we've talked about it at length. The biggest selling point that Texas has added to their repertoire now is having that SEC logo on their chest. These schools have had that. They've had that advantage. They've known for a while now that, that it, it's no longer uh, a, a promise, you know, that Texas will be in the SEC. It's now the reality. Um, and, and so I think for Texas, it's an advantage having been in the college football playoff this year to now say we're headed to the SEC. We're going to be playing on the biggest stage. Uh, but I'm looking at, across you know the SEC currently, Bobby, and I'm seeing teams like Kentucky, Missouri, especially. The work that they're doing in the portal is tremendous. South Carolina is another school. Like these programs that you know, the last five, six, seven years, you you might not consider them to be, you know, uh, in that upper, mid to upper tier of SEC programs are feasting currently. We just saw Missouri snag Caden Green from Oklahoma via the portal, and it's all because of what that that program has has, has done on the field and how it's, you know, kind of combining that with the off the field uh, opportunities as well. So, I mentioned Kentucky earlier this year, and I mean, Ole Miss, how could I not mention Ole Miss and the work that they've done in the portal uh, as two of the biggest winners that we've seen so far uh, in, in, you know, engaging, you know, portal transfers, uh, adding, uh, you know, experienced talent to the roster. Those are two schools that are very, uh, very much standing out to me currently. And, you know, that's just the new, the new world that Texas is walking into, you know, I mean, it's a different type of talent that is being attracted to Ole Miss and Kentucky and Missouri and South Carolina than it is, you know, a Baylor or an Iowa state or Kansas for that matter. It's there's levels to this, as you mentioned. All right, Joe, we got some super chats that we need to knock out real quick. And then we're going to come back to some of these conversations. Uh, Texas for real says after careful consideration and watching and listening to many Texas channels, I would like to take my lurking talents to on <laughs> Texas football hook on Texas for real. We appreciate it. We appreciate all of you for tuning in, especially on a big day like today. There's no doubt about it. I celebrate with us, man. That's yeah, no, I think we'll take that commitment. Yeah, it, it, it's it's like uh, this. This is the one of the things reason why we created this in the first place, guys. We wanted people to find a place where they could just kind of chill out and be excited about the Longhorns uh, while getting some news and reality about what's going on behind the scenes as well. Uh, and so thanks for joining us. We really appreciate everybody. And, and I can't wait to see a lot of you guys down in New Orleans. Uh, we've, I've met a lot of you guys at the tailgated Alabama and uh, we've had some, uh, you know, places like the co-op uh, for remotes. Uh, if you're coming to uh, Alabama, by the way, uh, or excuse me, if you're coming to the, the Sugar Bowl, by the way, I'm going to be all day at a party at Manning's. Yes, that Manning's. It's Arch Manning's, Archie Manning's uh, place on, in the French Quarter slash warehouse district, guys. Uh, it, it is the place that I'm going to be. Uh, make sure you sign up to go to that if you're down there and you have the time. Uh, of every single place, go to Texas Sugar Bowl. Dot, dot party. It's Texas Sugar Bowl dot party. And what they're doing down there is this really kind of cool thing uh, where basically a $50 donation goes to the Texas One Fund. That's the actual NIL arm of the University of Texas for players. So for a hundred bucks, basically a $50 donation goes for that. And then 50 goes to non-alcoholic beverages and food. Food is essentially a buffet type thing 
but it's also at Manning's, which is Archie Manning's place uh, down there between the warehouse district and uh, the uh, French Quarter. Uh, there's also a, a VIP level if you want to go on there. Use the code Bobby uh, to get into that VIP level. I think it's sold out otherwise. Uh, but my point is this. We're going to watch the games all day. We're going to talk Texas football all day. Uh, you, there's hundreds of TVs at Manning's. Then at 615, this is kind of one of the cool parts of it. Uh, CJ, you'll be down there with me as well. At 615, there's going to be a procession, which is called a second line parade. You see those guys in the jazz band there. They're actually going to be playing New Orleans favorites as well as Texas fight in the eyes of Texas walking to the Superdome. There's already over 800 people signed up for this. So there's going to be like a procession, hopefully, of a thousand plus Longhorn fans following a long uh, following a New Orleans jazz band, and it's called a second line parade. They'll kind of allow us to kind of move down the street to the game. Uh, but join us and uh, join me, CJ, and others uh, there as well. We hope to have some special guests uh, join us too uh, as well. But uh, that's Texas Sugar Bowl dot party. Texas Sugar Bowl dot party. Uh, join us in New Orleans. That'll be where you can see CJ and I uh, next. Uh, real quick, I'm going to read this uh, super chat from Antonio Harris before we move on to the next conversation. He says, I took off work to enjoy the show in peace. Thanks for all you do. Hook on. Thank Hook you, up. Antonio. Thanks, <laughs> Antonio. For sure. All right, guys. Well, one thing that we haven't talked about, a lot of these kids that Texas has signed today are going to be playing in some uh, All-American games here soon. Of course, you got the one in San Antonio and then the one in Florida, the Under Armour game. Uh, CJ, I know you're going to be heading out to the Under Armour game. Talk a little bit about who you're expecting to see out there. No, I'm excited for the Under Armour game. Haven't been out there before. I'll also be headed down to San Antonio for the All-American Bowl game down there as well, right after uh, the turn of the calendar to the 2024 year. But what you can expect to hear from uh, Longhorn-wise in the Under Armour game is running back Jarek Gibson. Uh, excited to see him in person for the first time. And, you know, it, it's always fun, Bobby, and, and – and, and Blake, we always hear about you know the 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 kind of rivalry between the two bowl games and, and the game chat. But it, this year for the Under Armour game, it'll be Jarrett Gibson, Colin Simmons, uh, Zeno Mazelu, Kobe Black, Xavier Filsami, and uh, Jordan Johnson Rubel. So a, a strong contingency of Texas defensive backs in that Under Armour game. And then down in San Antonio, uh, it'll be quarterback Trey Owens and punter Michael Kern. So not as strong as the in-state representation uh, at, for the bowl game down here in in uh, San Antonio, but excited to get a good look at you know the future of the Texas Longhorns. And uh, I'm sure I'll be bringing some positive updates and and uh, feedback from, from talking to these guys uh, whenever these All-Star games kick off. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel Cruz, by the way, just got recently added to the uh, Under Armour game. So you'll Good be able deal. to see the big center from Richland Hills in that game as well. Uh, I'll be interested to see what you think of them, CJ, when you see them in practice, because uh, those defensive backs uh, could be uh, big early for Texas next year, given the attrition that we've seen at safety. Uh, you said Kobe Black, Xavier Filsamy, uh, and Jordan Johnson Rebel all in that game, as well as Colin Simmons, Zena Umiozulu uh, on the edge. That'll be big. Uh, and Jarrett Gibson, uh, the running back along with Daniel Cruz. The, the San Antonio game has Michael Kern, the punter, and Trey Owens, the quarterback. That's it as of, as of right now. Is that correct? That is. Okay. As, of, as of last check, those are it's just the two of them. Okay. Um, hey, it's uh, it's nearing the top of the hour, about 15 minutes until. And so I want to re reiterate for people that have joined, we're waiting on Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker out of Jasper, to make his decision. We're waiting on the NLI of Ryan Wingo. Uh, that's going to be an interesting one. 20 of 22 players have already signed. Wingo and Aaron Hampton are the two that have not. Wingo, one of the top players in this class for the Longhorns. Uh, we do not know if he's just delaying signing or if Missouri's making real inroads right now. Uh, as far as Hampton is concerned, uh, we expect him potentially to peel off and go to Alabama. Uh, we're waiting on a timeline for that. Some people are saying as late as 3 o'clock. For Aaron Hampton. I don't know exactly what all that'll mean. Then Steve Sarkeesian has his press conference today at 3, 3.30. C.J. Vogel will be there. We'll be on the air as well. Uh, and then we're also waiting on Trey Moore, a young man uh, from UTSA to make a decision. 
We do not know that today is his time frame, though. He could hold off uh, for for quite a while. All right, uh, let's get to questions and do some questions and answers. Blake, if you're ready to roll them out. I am ready. We're going to uh, do some super chats here. This first one from Roberto Weller, and I believe that's that Guatemalan. <laughs> is what the PTQ is. He says, am I alone in being against getting transfer players from rivals Oklahoma and Texas A&M? I get trying to flip them before college, but transfers, they made their choice. You know, that, that's a that's a fair question in some regards, but, you know, you've seen Jared Wiley go to TCU, go do okay. Brennan Thompson, you mentioned, go to OU. Uh, Texas hasn't taken any from OU or A&M that I recall, uh, but they, maybe they would. You know, I don't I don't want to preclude that from happening. Um, the one thing I would I would say to that is, you know, what about transfers from coaching staffs? Right. I mean, look at look at our guy uh, right now, Nick Saban and what he just did. He took he took a mid year transfer from Michigan's coaching staff and added him to the, his coaching staff prior to a game that's now two weeks away. I mean, so would you take a player? You know, I, I get your understanding, but a a coach even goes even further. So you know where Nick, what Nick Saban says about that. He's definitely going to take him. That's crazy to think about, too. I, I know he was literally a coach. I How saw that know? news, and I'm not sure I even put that you know two and two together there. I, I wow, wow, uh, awesome. <laughs> All right, guys, we got some more Super Chats that we're going to knock out. Damon Graham says, great time to be a Longhorn and a Longhorn and a great time to tune into On Texas Football. Loyalty, thanks for making this fun. Well, Damon, thank you for tuning in. Definitely appreciate it and appreciate the Super Chat. And then, CJ, this one's from you, from your buddy Will. He says, why would I want to meet CJ? Will, you didn't, you, you didn't share that same sentiment when I ran into you in Dallas? I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> we had a great time. <laughs> All right, guys. Then, then a super chat from Sean. And uh, thank you, Sean. He says, I'm going to celebrate this successful National Signing Day by drinking a flight by Yingling Beer Hook'em. Sean, have fun. Thank you. Yingling's uh, been one of our sponsors from the outset. Uh, we really appreciate them as well as Faust Distributing and in in their company being part of uh, On Texas Football and, and really helping launch us. Uh, this year. We really appreciate it. Well, Sean, it sounds like a long day's ahead of you. So come get some food with us as well at Manning's. I have been Longhorn Frenzy. He says, I really appreciate what you guys bring. Y'all make my mornings at work a little more tolerable. Keep pumping out that quality content and hook them. Thank you, Longhorn. We appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate it. Okay, guys. One of the best. Uh, For sure. We're going to take a... uh, a couple of questions here. And this one from Woody talking about Colin Simmons. He said, I watched the state championship game. Is Simmons big enough to play defensive end in the SEC? Maybe outside linebacker. What are y'all's thoughts on that? I, I think it's a fair question um, because I think it's fair to question every single recruit, five star to one star, right? Um, here's my, my thought process on that. Texas plays really with two big down linemen no matter what. So like Sweat and Murphy this year, Baron Sorrell is not, Baron Sorrell is more of a three down guy, right? He's more of a five technique uh, long-term. Uh, Ethan Burke is more of that stand-up guy, right? So I could see them using him in that role with that Ethan Burke role. So I could see a little bit of that, but I think he's going to be big enough because the issue with him is how natural he is as a pass rusher. That's what gets lost in the conversation. Uh, guys that are smaller that can be play disruptors, and he's not super small, by the way. He's going to get bigger. Um, he, I mean, he plays basketball. People don't realize that he played basketball for Duncanville for a couple of years. So a state championship um, winning team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he's 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 not this guy that's just been in the weight room his entire life. Even though people see him that way because he's such a great prospect and been rated that way. He's still got some growth to do too, guys. Um, and so um, I would I would take that that I'm not as worried about that because one, he's got that suddenness we talk about that is rare. I mean, he literally he closes on you. He's got long arms, so even though he's not extremely tall, his wingspan is tall, right? Yeah. Uh, CJ, what do you think about that question? Because I think it's a fair one. 
No, I, I originally had that same kind of concern, you know, when, when t- I, I really, you know, first started hearing about Colin Simmons and, and saw him coming into a senior season, you know, for a five-star guy off the edge, you know, that six, two and a half, you know, kind of range is, it really makes you question, all right, like how high is the ceiling for Colin Simmons? And then you watch him in person, you see the bend, you see the athleticism. And like you said, Bobby, it's the suddenness. You know, a, a lot of what makes Micah Parsons so great is the combination of the speed and the physicality uh, of being the, you know, long arm uh, attack off the edge and then swipe underneath or get to the edge. You know, that's something that Colin Simmons has. And, you know, you see the photo there. Micah Parsons is still in cleats there, you know, and, you know, it, no one's questioning how tall he is because you see the production on the field. And with Simmons, you've seen the production now, the high school ranks and how he projects into, uh, you know, the college ranks as well is just something that I think will carry over in the the, the, the height concerns more so shouldn't be uh, factored in when you consider consider the arm length and the speed. All right, guys, we have a super chat here from Kyle, and he says, do you think that Wingo is holding out because of Evan Stewart in the portal? CJ, I'm going to let you answer that one. No, I don't. Uh, you know, this is yeah, this has been a recruitment that Texas has been after, you know, since the beginning of the cycle. Texas has made it very clear how they see uh, Ryan Wingo, and, you know, they have big plans for him. Also, I don't see the two of them, you know, battling out for his, a, a position battle. You know, if you will, uh, uh, either join your campus, or, uh, you know, this fall. Bobby, you had a, a quick update on Ryan Wingo recently is, you know, he's, you know, just now waking up. So yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would expect, you know, some news on him coming relatively soon now that we're, you know, getting close to 10 a.m. Yeah, I, I, you would hope so. I mean, look, it, it's irregular that. A guy's not up and going on Sun- National Signing Day when a day that changes his life. Uh, but we'll see what exactly happens here with Ryan Wingo. Um, I do have a question for the group. I-, I can't go and check this behind the scenes while we're talking. Has D'Alen Evans signed with Texas A&M? Can anybody go and look and see if he's put that up or if A&M has announced him thus far, please? Honestly. Because I'm looking at this one. I'm looking at this question from E. Kim. Any new updates on po- any possible February signings? Any new updates on possible February signings? Um, if Ryan Wingo bolts, I can definitely see Texas going after Aaron Butler out of Calabasas, California. They made contact, Chris Jackson did a couple weeks ago, uh, just to keep him, make sure that he knew that if, if something came available that they would be interested. I can see Texas going there. Other possible February signings, uh, Ryan Williams, the uh, wide receiver out of Sarah Land in Mobile, uh, although I think that's going to be a tough pull from Alabama or Auburn. Dominic McKinley, Texas could re-engage there. Uh, D'Alen Evans, if he has not signed with Texas A&M today. And then Alex Foster, uh, the defensive tackle out of Greenville, Mississippi. All of those guys uh, expected to announce in, December, in February. So that's what would be left on the – on the hook there for uh, e, uh for e Kim. Yeah, Bobby, as of what is it, 958, Texas AM has not announced the signing of DeAlen Evans. Uh again, this is something to monitor. Uh we talked about Texas potentially moving back into him uh you know his recruitment following the signing day. Um but you know we'll provide an update should they announce any type of signing or uh you know NLI acceptance coming in. Okay, guys, a lot of Super Chats just came in, so we're going to get through some of those real quick. And this big one here from Zach Harvey. Zach, we got to say thank you for that. He says, thank you guys for the content. Hook them from Little Rock, Arkansas. The wife surprised me with Sugar Bowl tickets. What do y'all think about the game? And, and, you know, there's been so much recruiting stuff going on. We haven't even talked about, you know, Texas going into the college football playoff today. But he does want our thoughts on the game. So, Bobby, I'm going to let you start. Hey, well, Bobby, I mean, real quick, real yes. quick, Ryan Wingo has tweeted he's up, he's awake. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, but to he's your up point. and rolling. There we go. <laughs> Love it. Hey, uh, Zach, uh, Texas is in that scenario uh, right now the favorite over Washington, but 
look, there are stats, advanced stats that say Washington is actually a 53% favorite to win this game. So it is a true split down the middle. Who's going to win this? Last year, Washington beat Texas. Michael Penix was held to a, a one of his worst performances of the season. Quinn Ewers really started throwing the ball because Texas couldn't run it at all with Keelan Robinson. And uh, you remember Jonathan Brooks was still a little injured, so only had nine carries and had that touchdown reception on that throwback screen that uh, Steve Sarkeesian likes to roll out at least once a game. Um, my, my take on this game is really pretty simple. I think it's going to come down to who executes the best in the fourth quarter. Uh, I think both teams will score points. I think both teams' defenses will have something special for the opposing offense that will you know, mitigate the, 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 the situation. But I think it's going to come down to, at the end of the day, Michael Penix trying to beat the Texas defensive front and the secondary – and Quinn Ewers and his receivers trying to get the best of uh, of them. It'll come down to a fourth quarter game. Uh, I yeah. don't know which way it's going to go. I don't no, know. No, I'm excited for it because most of these semifinals that we've seen over the years have not been close. And, you know, it's it's one of those things to, to hope for a blowout, especially when your team's involved. Uh, but for college football fans in general, this, this matchup feels very even on paper. And, Bobby, I'm – very excited to dig into, you know, kind of the matchup that we're expecting moving into uh, the later later parts of December here. But, you know, that Texas-Washington game from a year ago, it, it felt completely out of whack from what we've seen from Texas under Steve Sarkeesian. Quinn Ewers threw the ball 47 times. And as you mentioned, there really wasn't a running game due to the injuries uh, or the injury of Jonathan Brooks, the opt-outs from Roshan and Bijan. And obviously Keenan Robinson did all he could. But that's not been the the go to guy in that running running back room since he's he's arrived basically. So it, it was a very out of character game for Texas. Uh, I don't expect that you know obviously with everybody fully healthy and expecting to play uh, this this you know what, January first. So a lot to dive into. I'm sure you know I, I, you and I and Rod and Blake and and everybody will have a lot of input. I'm very excited for it. Uh, it's going to be a fun game. I love how Texas matches up here. All right, guys, this next Super Chat is from Dave Pierce, and uh, he says, got a new pup named Bevo, just came home, maybe next a hamster named Uga. <laughs> That's That's great. Great. Oh, puppy. oh, dude, I love, uh, hey, I've got, I can't compare the two, but Blake, you have a son named Colt for a certain reason, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. Uh, I love it when people do that. To, uh, look, uh, I, it's fun to be a Longhorn right now. I want to go back to Zach. People have asked also in the chat where that 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 uh, address is for that uh, uh, the post or the pregame on January first. If you want to join us, it's Texas Sugar Bowl dot party. Texas Sugar Bowl dot party. Again, it benefits the Texas One Fund all. And if there's extra money left over from whenever, they're giving it to the Texas One Fund. That's the whole idea is to 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 uh, help uh, Texas NIL efforts as well. And to have fun along with it, along the way. Yep. All right. And then uh, Jake Riddle wants to know, is Xavier Worthy going to be good to go against Washington? Yeah, absolutely. Out of the boot. Uh, has been practicing over the weekend and into this week as well. Uh, the month off from the Big 12 championship game has really allowed him to recover. Uh, he will be 100% come uh, January 1st against Washington. Okay, guys. We got a super chat from Eric. 76 he says bobby i went into the transfer portal and the grass is not greener on the other side here to oh. say and keep up the culture bobby the people's chant bobby burton <laughs> hook em. thanks i appreciate it man we really do i'm ready for uh, uh ready to get through this uh, signing day waiting on ryan wingo still right now that's the big news also waiting on aaron hampton and ty anthony smith uh guys 20 the hay is in the barn on 20 of 22 guys or 20 of 23 guys right um, and you know, what, what happens, uh, wait a minute, Ga Texarkana game day. This is a good one from James Manning just posted report on Hampton signing at noon today, Hampton signing at noon today. That should be one that we keep up with guys, uh, and make sure that, uh, it's awesome. That's one of the great things about Texas that you don't see in smaller cities around the, the country, like Meridian, Mississippi is not talking about 
a player in its area signing today. There, the Jackson paper has to do it. This is one of the great things I love about Texas high school sports. It's such a part of fabric of the community that you get the smaller outposts really generating the news up for the larger statewide stuff. And uh, thanks for posting that, James. We'll be on the lookout uh, for Aaron Hampton at noon today. All right, guys, we're going to move on to some more questions here. And uh, let's talk about this one from Douglas Mayfield. He says, can we talk about Sark? What are the chances he rolls this success into a long-term dynasty, such as Saban at Bama, for years to come? Fingers crossed. It's going to be tough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, That's it's only been done by one guy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean – that's tough. I mean, maybe more like a Jimmy Johnson slash Dennis Erickson slash uh, Larry Coker run at Miami. Um, maybe a Mac Brown like run in the aughts. You know, the 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 saving thing has just been remarkable. I mean, he's considered the goat for a reason, greatest of all time. Um, and so I, I think you have to wonder. Uh, if that can be replicated in today's college football age with the portal in particular, where like Saban, one of the things that y'all, a lot of people don't realize he stockpiled talent like crazy, especially along the defensive line. I mean, he had seven and eight NFL defensive linemen and four of them didn't see the field for entire years at a time. So I don't know that you're going to be able to do that going forward as easily with the portal. Uh, but, you know, can we see a dominant era of Texas football? I, yes, we could. Do I say that it's more than a 50-50 shot? I don't know. Uh, but I think Steve Sarkeesian recruiting in that caliber, in that category, and has the coaching staff in that category. So it's just like this year, mixing all that together and putting out the product is a, is a, is a different a different discussion, but I think they're headed all signs be point to be headed in that direction. I mean, nobody has a backup quarterback right now, like Arch Manning. I mean, and that's the most important position on the, on the field, in my opinion. So um, I, that's the quarterback position will be important. And then every other piece, these top five classes are the, the fill in the blank. You have to get those guys to be competitive overall. Yeah. Real quick, Bobby, to your point, not only was he able to get talent on campus, he was able to uh, retain it. And that's going to be the biggest challenge in this new era of the portal uh, for Texas. And, again, it's it's only been done by Nick Saban. So, tall task, but Texas is on the right path, I would say. All right, guys, we're getting lots of questions about McKinley. Lots of people, obviously, in and out. Lots of new people joining us. But uh, I think it's important to note here this report from Steve Steve Wiltfong of 24-7. He says, Dominic McKinley won't sign during the early signing period. His mother tells 24-7 Sports he'll take officials to LSU in Tennessee in January. He FaceTimed with Steve Starkeesian this week. Brent Venables was recently in home. Uh, no mention of, of Mike Elko there, where he's been committed to, uh, where Dominic McKinley committed to uh, earlier this year over Texas and Oklahoma. I wonder if Elijah Robinson uh, was the key there for that recruitment for the Aggies. And now that he's headed to, to Syracuse to be the defensive coordinator, uh, that McKinley just doesn't uh, isn't out of it now for, for uh, Texas A&M. He's not yeah. saying that he's decommitted, but that sure doesn't sound promising for the Aggies. Uh, no and it's all. squarely in it, right? Five-star, by the way, guys, five-star. <laughs> Very true. All right, you're watching the Coffee and Football Signing Day Special presented by Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. And guys, it's been a while since we've kind of ran down everything. So for those that have just joined us, uh, let, let's do just that. And CJ, I'm going to let you go down the list and tell everybody who has signed thus far this morning. Yeah, I mean, a, a great showing so far. As we've mentioned, all but two members of the class so far have have, have you know submitted their – NLI so far, Trey Owens, Christian Clark, Jarrett Gibson, uh, Parker Livingstone, Freddie DuBose, uh, Jordan Washington, and then all three offensive linemen as well, Brandon Baker, Daniel Cruz, and Nate Kibble are in. Uh, only awaiting the signature of Ryan Wingo on the offensive side of the ball. 
heading to the defensive side of the ball. The front seven is locked in, all on the defensive line. Uh, Melvin Hills, DeAndre Robinson, Alex January, Colin Simmons, and Zeno Umiozulu is in. Uh, the defensive backs are in. Obviously, we're waiting to see what happens with Aaron Hampton. Uh, you know, we're thinking, as we heard earlier from the Texarkana game day, that noon is looking like we will hear about the movement with Hampton. But Santana Wilson, uh, Jordan Johnson, Rubel, Kobe Black, Wardell Mack, uh, and Xavier Filsamy are in. So, very good. Oh, and Michael Kern, don't let me forget the special teams there. Uh, but very good early slate, you know, three hours into signing day. We'll await what happens with Aaron Hampton. Uh, we just mentioned Dominic McKinley, and obviously Ryan Wingo is the big one that is still outstanding on the offensive side of the ball. All right, guys, plenty of time to get your questions in, so please do so. We'd also appreciate it if you'd hit that like and subscribe button. Be sure to ring the bell so you're notified anytime we post a video right here on On Texas Football. And uh, we have a super chat here from Drew M. And Drew says, this is for CJ's Longhorn hat fun. <laughs> hey, he Christmas is right around the corner. I know what I'm expecting. And I, I, I've seen the comments. I, I'll get it right. <laughs> <laughs> you need one so bad, dude. Oh, no. Hey, I got the shirt on, though. I know. You got your Sugar Bowl shirt on. You got your <laughs> Sugar Bowl shirt on. All right, guys. This, Bobby, this next question is from you, from Joel McWaters Preaches Sometimes. He says, Bobby, how often have you heard a recruit turn down a school because of the way the fans of that school have treated or mistreated its players? Um, It's not normal. I, I would I, I have heard of it before. It's not unheard of. But I would say that happens one to five percent of the times, maybe. It's not, it's not like, and, and I will say this people on message boards, the parents, and even in this chat, parents and players read the message boards. They read the comments. Oh, this guy, my son can't do this, or I'm not supposed to be. But I will say the college coaches, not just at Texas but across the board, do a nice job of telling those guys, hey, the, you know, you're going to get the, the the full spectrum of comments from fans. Don't believe the best of what they say and don't believe the worst of what they say, you know, because the truth is it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and so college coaches, they they understand that and they tell them, hey, we all have, not, not that they say, not that they won't use it. Oh, Texas has particularly bad fans or, Oh, the Aggies are are a cult, or you know, I'm sure they say that. Um, but the point is, everybody knows that it's one of those things uh, that message boards are a part of college football. I think 20 years ago, when message boards were really just proliferating, it was different. But now everybody has crazy fans. Everybody says bad things and good things about players, and parents and coaches know that to be the case. All right, guys, this next question here is from Jay, and he says, is the recruiting landscape still changing in the state of Texas? I think so. I mean, I think it goes in cycles and in waves. Texas is only going to sign two of the top 10 players in the state of Texas this year, even though they'll have a top five class nationally. That means Texas is not recruiting as much or relying as, as much on the state of Texas. But when Texas becomes a, a, a major player in college football by being in the college football playoff, I bet that changes next season because more of those top line guys like the Colin Simmons and the Xavier Filsomese of this recruiting class will end up wanting to be part of Texas next year, like they were with John T. Cook and Manny Muhammad and Anthony Peel last year. So they, they, they jumped on the ship a little early. Now Texas and Steve Sarkeesian has a chance to do it. And I'll add this, and, and I've mentioned it a couple of times, Steve Sarkeesian's always been batting from, from behind with recruits in the state of Texas. Jimbo Fisher had a several-year head start. I go back to David Hicks last year, the defensive lineman out of Katy. He signed with AM because AM started recruiting him when he was a freshman. Steve Sarkeesian didn't know who David Hicks was when, when David Hicks was a freshman, right? But they AM had this long-standing relationship. Well, now think about it. The regional rivals that Texas competes about, against in the state of Texas – which are Texas A&M, Oklahoma, and LSU, of those four play coaches, 
Steve Sarkeesian is the senior coach of that group. And he's only been in Texas three years now. So that dynamic has changed in the state of Texas too. And I think that'll benefit the Longhorns and Coach Sark going forward. Yeah, I hope that question was a, a little bit of a shot towards a fan account at, you know, out west in Lubbock. So I saw <laughs> through that. I saw through that. I recognized it. Uh, but but no, it it will remain, you know, a, a, a very heavily or heavily dominated, um, you know, blue chip prospect, you know, era by Texas A&M, Texas and Oklahoma in the state of Texas. Obviously, you'll have Ohio State poaching. Uh, you know, Clemson seems to do it once or twice a year. Uh, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, they'll all have, you know, a pitch to these top guys in the state of Texas. Uh, Bobby, to your point, I wanted to mention just one other school that we've briefly talked about in the past that will become a new thorn in the side of Texas, and it's SMU. You know, I think what SMU is able to pitch in the portal will trickle down into the high school ranks, obviously, now that they're making the jump, the eventual jump to a Power 5 conference. You know, there's a lot of old money there at SMU, and that provides a lot of opportunities off the field for players that want to stay home. And I don't think any school in you know, the country really has adopted more of, of a stay-at-home mindset, you know, owning what is Dallas and what is, you know, being able to stay home and play for your school. Houston's starting to do it a little bit. But I would argue that SMU is doing it better than anybody in the country at the moment. So uh, I, I saw that comment. I laughed because I knew where it was headed, and it's towards that account that covers the Red Raiders out in Lubbock. But to to give it a, an honest answer, that would only be the that would, that would that would really be the one thing I would see that's a, a new variable in the Texas recruiting landscape, and it is kind of this emergence of SMU. And we're seeing what they're doing in the portal. Savion Bird is returning. Omari Abor is returning home. It's interesting, and I think it'll, you know, there it, it won't be for every recruitment, but it'll be, you know, one or two every now and then that'll make you say, hmm, eh, that's weird. You know, SMU's making a strong push, and that, that'll be, you know, why that is. That's great. I, I think SMU is, is a little bit of a sleeping sleeping program. They they had 10-plus wins this year, too, kind of quietly. Yeah. Um, they The thing that they – you talk about old money now – they are forgoing revenue from the ACC for 10 years. That's how committed they are. Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I think that 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 could be an interesting one. You know, SMU back in the, the payola days, frankly, uh, was a thorn in everybody's side because they did exactly that. Um, and there's a reason why Big 12 schools never wanted them in the conference. Yes, there's a reason there is. for that. I, I want to say this about SMU. The, the problem they have, they don't have a big stadium. They don't have a big fan base. Right. Um, and so uh, I, I can see what you're saying. Let's let's wait and see how they do in the ACC. Because Fair. I don't think they're going to win 10 games in the ACC. I'll put it that way. Fair. Agreed. Uh, all right, guys. Kevin Hua says, what differentiates between a four- and five-star recruit? Are there often noticeable differences on the college level? Well, yes, there are. Um, so – the, the, the idea behind a five-star recruit is, is this guy a future first-round draft pick? That's the question. And if a group of people that do the rankings say, yes, he is, then that's where they put him. They put him as a five-star. And they've even gone so far nowadays, guys, as trying to figure out exactly how many offensive linemen go in the first round, how many quarterbacks go in the first round. How many defensive backs go? So they're even combing it down further, which I think it doesn't necessarily make sense because here's the reality of it. Better to go with the better player and prospect than force numbers of, of a position into your top 32 because then you get a wider variance. Like I've, I've seen some guys be drastically overrated because they're an edge prospect or an offensive tackle and they're a premium position. So therefore they should be higher rated. I don't necessarily agree with that. So, yeah, I think the number one thing that different differentiates the two is with most five-star guys, you walk into a room and you say, wow, you know, you know, guys might be able to move the same. Similarly, you might be able to, you know, measurably, you know, find comparisons between four stars and five stars, but more times than not, it's the physical presence 
of, of just the overall makeup of a prospect and obviously, you know, what they can do in the weight room and how that translates to the field. You know, I, I remember looking at DJ Campbell very early in his career, seeing him, you know, he, he, he you know, paves roads for running backs, but he did so in a way that was so fast and so quick and athletic for an offensive lineman that it, it was astounding. You know, there's clips of him pulling and getting to the, you know, the, the secondary basically before the running back even crossed the line of scrimmage. That's how fast he was. And I think that is the biggest difference in terms of, you know, those guys that are good quality blue chip prospects and the guys that you expect to be three and done and in the league on, you know, on day two, basically. All right, so I want to bring this comment up from Menu 2 Sports. He says, Jerry Hamilton is reporting that Daylon Evans would not sign in December and would be taking visits to three schools, including Texas, in January. Yeah, I just want to make sure that reports today um, yep, because this is all over see. the map. Yeah, I mean, uh, but yes, uh, our friend Jerry is, is uh, still at on three working with those guys and reporting that Daylon Evans would not be signing in December and would be taking visits to three schools, including Texas, in January, uh, USC, I believe in Oklahoma, the other two um, committed to A&M, though, and visited there over the weekend. But here's the funny part about that. Uh, and CJ, you were the one that sent this to our threat, our internal thread. Tell people exactly what you saw over the weekend about D'Alen Evans and Xavier Filsamy and that, that sort of thing. Just to clue people in that didn't already know about it. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's it's interesting. You know, I. Um, I don't know. Recruiting is interesting. Um, I, sorry, Bobby. Remind me one one more no, time. Xavier Filsamy is live. Instagram live. Where D'Alen oh. Evans came on. Yeah, sorry. No. The, the the interesting word of we. You know, where are we going? With the horns up emoji was used by D'Alen Evans uh, on the Instagram live of Xavier, Xavier Filsamy. And, you know, I think that's very interesting. I mean, how often do you see the 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 use of we by an in-state rival that commit you know that that's very interesting obviously it shows texas is circling back around you know it's kind of playful at times between recruits but that right there is something to monitor obviously uh because very shortly after that xavier committed to texas and here we are you know celebrating his uh signing today um yes uh i absolutely believe it uh is is an issue for the to the aggies and for texas to monitor uh, because Texas is going to take a defensive tackle. They want one more. And there are three on the board right now. Dominic McKinley, De'Alen De Evans, and Alex Foster. All three pushing their decision, we believe, off to the second signing day. Now, Foster may surprise us today and ink with Baylor, after all. We don't know that for sure. But those are the three things that we're looking at. Some people asking if Texas is still uh, in the running for Ryan Wingo right now. We're waiting for him to sign his letter of intent, uh, and we'll go from there with that uh, when and if he does. Uh, we're also waiting on Aaron Hampton and his decision, the young man out of Dangerfield, thought to be flipping potentially to Alabama today from Texas. And then Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker out of Jasper, still waiting on his, him and his decision. Uh, people also asking other questions about who else might be out there for Texas. Well, if, if, if Ryan Wingo, for whatever reason, doesn't sign with Texas, Aaron Butler out of Calabasas, California, a top 50, 100 player in the country is out there. Terry Bussey might come back around out of Tempson. Uh, he's the five-star that uh, is currently committed to A&M, but also looking heavily uh, at, uh, at LSU right now. Uh, we'll see what, what Texas decides to do here, uh, but you, you never know. Uh, Longhorns uh, trying to piece together this recruiting class uh, here at the very end. Uh, it is going to be a top 10 uh, class, no matter what, likely a top five at this point. Uh, Bobby, I'm going to ask you this. Zane Strigel says, so who do we go after if if or when Aaron Hampton flips? Yeah, that's kind of what I just went over. Uh, Aaron Butler, maybe, uh, out of, uh, uh, out of uh, Calabasas, California, is a possibility. I think you also look maybe at guys uh, like Terry Bussey out of Timpson. Uh, who had that tremendous uh, state championship per game performance. Uh, and then another one uh, might be, uh, it could be somebody else that we're not even talking about, like Ryan Williams, uh, the 2025 reclassification to 2024 uh, out of Alabama. Although I, 
I get the strong and sneaky sus suspicion that Williams is going to end up in either uh, at either Alabama or Auburn. Okay, guys, some more questions here coming in. And uh, let's see here. Let's take this one from Marco. Marco wants to know, who's the best high school prospect you've ever seen? For him, it is Clowney, Davion Clowney. Oh, man, Bobby, I can only imagine where you're headed with this one. <laughs> no, I, it's real clear for me. It's, it's Vince Young. Like, I'm not – I've seen – I, I – Saw Eric Dickerson in high school when I was a tot, you know, young kid. That doesn't count. Um, uh, Adrian saw Adrian Peterson. Saw, I mean, gosh, I've seen. I think I, I counted like fifteen Heisman Trophy winners. I saw Peyton Manning in high school. <laughs> Thought he was phenomenal, you know. Uh, Eli, I mean, go down the list. Uh, Charles Woodson. I saw Charles Woodson in Orlando Pace in the same week. I mean, they literally grew up like 30 minutes apart from each other. Um, Kevin Falk was a great high school player as a high school quarterback. I know that sounds just weird. Um, but Vince Young was the most dominating, single most dominating high school football player I ever saw. Adrian Peterson I saw. Um, like Tony Gonzalez was a great high school football player. Uh, just a, a number of different guys. But the, the most dominating high school football player I've ever seen remains Vince Young, period. Um, the, what he could do with his legs were just freaky at that level. And combined with the passing game, it wasn't really fair. Yeah. CJ? I, I mean, growing up in Allen, there's only one answer for me, and it's Kyler Murray. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, and it feels, you know, kind of odd picking the guy that played for A&M and Oklahoma, but – I mean, he graduated in 2015. I graduated in 20, 2016. So, I, I mean, we would lose in the playoffs second round every year, and it was immediately how soon can we get to, you know, Allen's games to go watch him work his magic, you know, for three straight years. You know, never lost as a starter, Gatorade National Player of the Year. I mean, it was a given that he was, you know, bound to do something tremendous, and he won the Heisman, first overall pick. How he wasn't a, a unanimous you know, five-star guy was outrageous. I know the height was a, a knock, but the speed was something I'd never seen the burst at a, as at quarterback. And then also being able to fling it, you know, 60 plus yards was incredible to me. Uh, the biggest thing about Kyler was I've never, and to this day, never seen him get rocked. You know, I think that's a testament for how, how much he uses his legs, how much he scrambles and kind of just dangles the ball out like this, you know, it's, He's never hit hard, and you know it, it, it's smart, you know, on him to get down, use that baseball sliding ability to to avoid big hits. But time and time again, I would see him pull ma magic out of a hat, and 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 really, you know, the, it was a combination of like a Johnny Manziel and today's Lamar Jackson to to just create just magic out of nothing. It was incredible to watch in high school, and you know, I'll always say he was probably the best high school player I've seen. Obviously, Bobby, I don't have the extensive. You know, history of seeing a lot of great prospects, but that right there was always the most fun. I I, I wish I could go back and see him back in, you know, when the, that Allen Stadium was being built again and, and just kind of yeah. relive that moment. But he was my number one guy. So I will say this, and why I picked Vince Young is some similar to why you're saying what what why you went to go see um, uh, Kyler Murray. They were worth the price of admission. Yes. How many – Vince Young I'm, – I'm just telling you. I saw Quan in high school too, Casey. How many people are worth the price of admission to a high school football game? If anybody pay, play, pay $5 to go see Vince Young play, they came away well satisfied with what they saw. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's uh, – yeah, and Earl Campbell. I mean, I, there, there are guys like that, that that are just worth the price of admission. And of all of those guys – I'm just still, I'm here to tell you, Kyler Murray had so many guys around him too, though, CJ. Sure. Um, Vince didn't have that many guys. He had Courtney Lewis and Fred Ward. Uh, Benny Swain was a guy. I saw, I saw DJ Williams was talking about who he, he was special. Garrett Wilson is a great high school player. Um, <laughs> Derek Johnson, all these guys, people are mentioning, um, you know, that that was interesting when the best high school backfield I ever saw, I think, 
was uh, Concord de La Salle. DJ Williams played at Miami, ended up being a first round pick in, in a, as a linebacker in college or out of Miami. Uh, he visited Texas one time, but his high school running back mate was Maurice Jones drew. <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty good. Oh, those, those two could, could, could tote the rock and they did not lose a game for, I think four years. So uh, th- there's, a, there's all kinds of stuff that I've seen, but, Man, the guys that are worth the price of admission, that's what I come back to. And those are rare. Those are really right. Earl Campbell's worth the price of admission. Yeah. And a, a name that hasn't been mentioned and I'm a, a bit surprised about is Jonathan Gray at Alito. I mean, he was another guy, you know, having grown up, I thought he was, you know, I, and I was much younger at the time, but his numbers and, you know, uh, again, I think he was a, a Gatorade National Player of the Year as well. He was, he was spectacular. Got it. All right, y'all. Well, we're going to take this question here from Shane Duffy. Shane asks, do y'all think there is still a portal receiver Texas is waiting for? I think it's possible. I mean, look, I think Texas needs two guys in the portal at receiver. I've said that. I mean, you have to get guys. I don't think it's Evan Stewart. They're not. I don't I don't I think Texas wants the right fit. I've said that from from jump here. Um I think they have to have two adults added to the room. Matthew Golden is one. Okay. They need a guy that's caught 40 or 50 balls somewhere else. So that Jonte Cook, Ryan Wingo, uh, DeAndre Moore, Ryan Niblett, Parker Livingstone, that you don't have to force them into action game one to be the be all end all. If you do that, you could set yourself up for, for failure, not to mention what happens if someone gets injured. You need some guys with some some uh, some some uh, long term understanding of the game, uh, because another thing is this, guys. By the way, Steve Sarkeesian likes to run all kinds of pre snap motion. Think about what they do. I mean, that took Adonai Mitchell time to adjust to this year, guys, and he's coming from a college program already. So those high school guys, I mean, that's. You don't want to see them lining up off sides or getting in motion wrong or that sort of thing. So I think those are a couple of things that you have to think about. And one of the reasons why I think Texas needs to take at least one uh, more portal receiver. It's funny that this is just brought up because I was actually going to bring this up uh, <laughs> right after you got done talking, Bobby. But Tim says, did you see, did you guys see that Trey Owens has a billboard in Katy somewhere Y'all got to pull it up, and there, there's the optimal viewing location um, right there. Let me hide this comment here for you, Matt. If you all want to go check it out if you're close by, but I have another picture of it. When Matt uh, gets done with this one right here, I'll bring it up, and this will be the actual picture. Let me see. It's going to be right here, guys. Check this out. There yeah. it is. <laughs> Alive. <laughs> And That's a Trey great Owens touch. Tweeted, he tweeted, ain't it beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, I that's a great touch. It. And I, I love seeing this on signing day every year. I think, you know, schools make, uh, you know, a, a, a strong effort to be unique in how signing days are announced. And we've seen it year and year again over the over the country with, you know, graphics, videos, you know, logos was a big one that Texas did a few years back. Uh, Parker Livingstone also tweeted it out as well. So it looks like that's going to be, you know, kind of the twist Texas puts on signing day this year. And it's a great touch. I mean, who doesn't want to be, you know, in in a way paraded around their town, you know, their city that they grew up in and celebrated. So awesome to see. I think it's a great idea by the Texas staff. And I mean, congrats again to the the players that signed today, because this is a, a moment I'm sure they won't ever forget. Oh, we have a Trey Owens question here from Scott, and he asked, "Do you guys think Trey Owens could be another Mac Jones?" I like Trey Owens a lot. We've talked about it in the past, you know. Uh, and and the good thing about Steve Sarkeesian and how you know, I guess, quickly or you know, it shows up in the development of quarterbacks is it doesn't take more than one year for a quarterback of on-field play in his system to be a highly coveted draft pick. We saw it with Mac Jones, obviously, uh, Tua and Jalen Hurts also in that same kind of time frame where we're, you know, battling it out, duking it out at Alabama as well. So, 
you know, whether or not it's a fair comparison to say uh, from, you know, a kind of a lower level rated guy at the quarterback position, I, I could certainly see a, 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 you know, a one year play of Trey Owens for, you know, a, a true draft ascension there. So it's not out of the realm of possibilities. I like Trey Owens a lot. I think he brings a, 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 a on his shoulders as well as a strong uh, set of talent and skill sets with his arm and, and athleticism. So if there's anyone that can get him to the next level, Steve Sarkeesian's the top of that list. I I like his I like his skill set. I've said it from the start. Um, he's a great developmental prospect at quarterback. Great. This is exactly what you need after an Arch Manning that comes in that's already been coached to the hilt as a high schooler. You need somebody to follow in, fall in that can th make all the throws and just needs to some seasoning and development. This is a perfect addition. Uh, Jerry and I talked about it earlier this season. It's just really a really good addition because he segues classes yet still has the talent and ability if he maximizes himself to be not only a good quarterback at Texas, but to be an NFL quarterback. He has those kind of, he has those kind of traits and it's one of the reasons why he's risen in the rankings over this year. I think those people have seen, okay, now I see what Steve Sarkeesian saw two years ago. Not unlike some people are saying about Malik Murphy now. Remember, Malik Murphy wasn't the highest rated quarterback coming out now either. Yet two years later, all of a sudden, oh, we this Malik Murphy guy might be somebody, right? I, I think Owens actually is more further along than Murphy was. In his development, there's no question about that. But same kind of traits, big, tall, maneuverability in the pocket and can make every throw. More accurate than Murphy, by the way, though. All right. MJF with the question. He asked, how many spots might UT keep open for those players that enter the portal from playoff teams after the New Year's Day bowl games? I was always told three to six was the number or four to six was the number in the portal. Keep in mind, one of them might be a punter. So that takes it down to, you know, three to five. They've, they're already at two with Matthew Golden and Andrew Makuba, right? Um, and so they're going to be, like I said, the word was judicious. That that thing, that, that uh, comment still, uh, you know, is my, in my opinion, is still accurate today. Um, so you look at that and what Texas has going on overall, uh, I could see they still need a tight end potentially if JT Sanders goes pro. Um, they may need help in the secondary still, given that they've had, what, three or four. They're losing five safeties this offseason. I could see them going there for, for help immediately. Um, not sure about linebacker. That may depend on David Benda's return. Um, so we'll have to wait and see about who all returns for Texas after the college football playoff. Sam Walton. Oh, uh oh, here we go. <laughs> Matt just put this up. Uh, it says the source with knowledge of their recruitment at 24 seven sports. know they think five-star receiver Ryan Wingo will remain true to his commitment to Texas after talking to Missouri the night before. And of course they rank Wingo, the number four receiver and number 12 prospect overall and say that he's one of the jewels of the Longhorn class, which they have ranked number five nationally. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that's from 24-7 Sports, by the way. Um, uh, you know, no doubt that Steve Wiltfong, uh, who has followed uh, uh, who has followed Wingo's uh, recruitment from the get-go as part of that. Interesting that he talked to Missouri last night. Uh, I wonder if that – I wonder if Evan Stewart, you know, the mere thought of him entering the portal did have some impact. I don't know. Uh, but – uh, long and short of it, uh, Texas needs to, to finish out the deal with with Ryan Wingo because he is a fantastic prospect, uh, five star, uh, and one of the to, to their point, one of the jewels of the Texas class. Okay, guys, Sam Walton wants to know: Are there any low key guys we could we could see flip our way that aren't in the national spotlight? Obviously, there's still another signing day, so you got two months. And CJ, I'm going to turn this over to you. Who do you think Texas could possibly go after in the next two months? Yeah, no, uh, it, 
I think we've talked about it, you know, kind of extensively on the defensive line specifically. You know, Alex Foster, DeAlan Evans, Dominic McKinley, all categorized as flips uh, for the Texas, you know, recruiting cycle in 2024. That's really the spot I'm, you know, most closely watching at the moment. I think, you know, if there were to be uh, a, another flip added to this class, it would be one of those three. Um, again, we've talked about, you know, whether they're signing today, signing in February. Alex Foster will be signing in, in February. Uh, Dominic McKinley is kind of on the fence, leaning a little bit towards February as well, whereas DeAlan Evans is, is more so a 50-50 toss-up with reports coming out that he will sign today with a and and others kind of saying he will wait towards the, uh, the, the, the wintry months of February as well. So that's really the spot. Bobby's laid out some receivers as well, whether, you know, something will go awry with – you know, Ryan Wingo or anything along the lines of that with Aaron Hampton as well. So uh, it is, you know, a, a topic of conversation. I think for the most part, Bobby, the 2024 candidates to join the class have, have been well covered so far. I don't think there's really a guy that has been, you know, not mentioned today. So uh, that's exactly where I sit there. It is something, you know, I think for now we should have a good idea, you know, come 630, 7 o'clock tonight of just what prospects will be remaining on the board uh, for Texas moving into the second signing day. Yeah, I would say this. Uh, I think all three of these defensive linemen are waiting till February based on latest Intel, CJ. That's Dominic McKinley out of Lafayette, the five-star. Dalen Evans, uh, the Aggie commitment uh, also. Uh, he from Longview's Pine Tree High School. Alex Foster, the defensive lineman out of Greenville, Mississippi. Those are the three that Texas has targeted thus far. They'd like one of those three for sure. Um, at wide receiver, we mentioned Terry Bussey out of Timpson, who's committed to AM, but likely not to sign today. Uh, Aaron Butler out of Calabasas, California. Uh, he's not signing today, but that would be predicated most likely on the decision by Ryan Wingo uh, today. So uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, the other thing that, uh, that I think that, we need to talk about is, you know, late, late ads that we don't even know about. There could be somebody out there, guys. Uh, that's only fair uh, to think about it that way. Uh, all right. We've got about 15 minutes left to go in this live stream. We're going to be back around 12. Uh, before we do that, I want to say thank you to our sponsor. That's Adam Lowy and the Lowy Law Firm. Uh, this co coffee and football signing day special brought to you by Adam and his group uh, at uh, Lowy Law Firm. 512-280-0800 or visit him at lowylawfirm.com. Uh, Adam and his group have been helping injured Texans for decades. Uh, if you've been injured on the job or in a car wreck and think you might be due comp compensation, give Adam and his team a shout. 512-280-0800 or visit him at lowylawfirm.com. Hey, before we go any further here, I think we need to retract and, and show – the folks, the the player pages, Blake, on every position. Let's start at quarterback with Trey Owens and go down his recruiting ranking uh, and some profile stats on him uh, as we go. All right, 6'5", 225. We've had him on this program. Trey ranked a three-star by a lot of schools, a lot of places. Rivals has him as a four. I think it's possible he goes up in the final on three rankings based on what I've heard. He was the Houston area Greater Houston area, touchdown club, player of the year. Just named that a couple of weeks ago. That hat he's wearing right there, that looks very familiar to me. We need to get CJ one of those. All right, uh, let, let's go to the next one. Uh, let's go to either Christian Clark or Jarrett Gibson, if you don't mind, Blake. Christian Clark is a running back out of Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, Four-star across the board, pretty much. Uh, this is a guy that Tashard Choice uh, picked up on very early in the process and prioritized over every in-state running back. So no matter where he's ranked nationally, Tashard Choice didn't care. He went for, for Christian Clark above and all above all other running backs across the country. He's out of Mountain Point. Uh, and uh, I think he's going to be one of the, the studs of this class. Uh, Jarek Gibson is the other running back. Uh, five, nine and a half. I saw him in person this year. He's rocked up, as you can see by that picture. Uh, I think he's going to be a guy – that Texas fans really like because he's a hard-nosed player. Uh, I mentioned earlier in this broadcast that I really think uh, Tashard Choice, of all things that he prioritizes, toughness may be the very their very biggest one. CJ, why don't you take the wide receivers? 
Absolutely. Freddie Dubose, you know, coming off of that. He's really rebounded and still found a way to be very much involved at Smithson Valley. He's, you know, a big part of that offense, gets a large t- uh, volume of a touch a game. Uh, should he come back 100% healthy? And there is some a little bit of a, a favoring of that knee still. He's a burner. And as Bobby mentioned earlier, one of the most explosive player or wide receivers in the country. Texas took him for a reason despite the injury. Uh, it's because of his very high ceiling. Then uh, moving to Parker Livingstone, one of my favorite players in the class, all-around uh, athlete, 6'3", six, 6'4", six, right in that range. Returns, kicks, punts, can throw a football pretty far as well. Uh, great athlete and is quick for being that big. You know, he can go up and get it 50-50 or he can take a screen to the house. And I've seen it plenty of times of in person. I'm a big fan of Parker, Parker Livingstone and what he brings uh, to the Texas offense. Uh, to tight end, Jordan Washington. Man, uh, basketball tight end uh, or tight end with a basketball background. Exactly what I love to see in tight ends. Uh, he, he brings a physicality to the game that, you know, is, is very rare for guys with that type of background. He's not afraid to get into the trenches and get dirty. And I was on top of that, very similar frame to Parker Livingstone can go up and high point the football. Uh, big fan of Jordan Washington. Might be a sleeper in the class as well. To the offensive line, Brandon Baker. Uh, you know, the five-star guy out of Matter Day in uh, California. The feet, the legs, the lower body are really what stand out to me. He has the physical presence at 6'5", 300 pounds, uh, projects to be a tackle at the next level. I think right tackle is where Texas has him penciled in at the moment, but it's really the feet and the athleticism with the lower body that stand out to me. Uh, And then moving to the inside, Nate Kibble. Uh, Bobby mentioned it earlier on the stream. It's the arm length. You know, being able to uh, reach the second level and into that safety spot is really impressive for Nate Kibble. And at the end of the day, a Tascacita offensive lineman, uh, there's a pretty high hit rate there. Uh, Moving to center, Daniel Cruz, smart kid. Exactly what you want as a center. I mean, this is a guy that understands the game, is very cerebral about the game of football, and in the run game especially – he will maul defensive linemen uh, and into the second level with, uh, with linebackers as well. Very fun uh, guy right there. Moving to the defensive line, Melvin Hills out of the boot, Louisiana. There's a reason why Bo Davis targeted him so early out of Lafayette. I mean, you watch the film, you understand, you know, just why the physical tools stand off the off the page. And Texas took him so early. One of the unique Louisiana prospects that had no interest in the LSU and Texas capitalized that. Uh, staying out what or out east, excuse me, with DeAndre Robinson. Uh, I mean, the highest ceiling of any defensive lineman in this class, in my opinion. Robinson was highly coveted by Ohio State. Uh, I mean, just an, an incredible prospect out there with little development right now, and that's kind of the big thing around. Uh, Texas's interest in Robinson is, you know, you see what Bo Davis has done with defensive linemen during his tenure at Texas. Robinson projects to be one of those guys that can follow suit and get into the NFL after three or four years. And then finally heading back up to Duncanville for the next two, Alex January is the biggest of the bunch, 6'5", 320. Uh, father played for Texas back in the day, multi-sport athlete, great athleticism. And, you know, right now is probably the most ready to play of the bunch uh, on this defensive line. And moving to his uh, his, his high school teammate, Colin, Colin Simmons, you know, the, the highest of coveted players in this Texas defensive class right now is the five star out of Duncanville. Uh, we've, we've shown the photo next to him and Michael Parsons, just what, you know, he brings to the table physic- or physically. Uh, it, it's impressive. The bend, the athleticism, uh, a similar uh, you know, kind of traits to what we'll talk about with Zena Umi Ozulu coming up next. But, but Colin Simmons is that is that guy off the edge. You know, there's a reason why he has five stars there. Uh, the best prospect Texas has brought in uh, under this uh, defensive staff off the edge is Colin Simmons. Uh, to Zena, I've watched him a number of times. When he has that flip switched to on, it's very rare to find a prospect that is more exciting and with more promise off the edge than what he brings. It's all about consistency and development for him. Luckily, we've seen it with his brother, Nato, that he is able to add 25 or 30 pounds to his frame and maintain uh, that level of athleticism. And, you know, again, that nastiness runs in the family. Back deep, Santana Wilson. Let me, uh, hey, CJ, I'll do, I'll do the DBs. You've got to be running out of breath. Takes the hey, take, I was, I was take a step, strong. man. <laughs> I, I love it, strong. I know. I love the. I love the enthusiasm. 
It shows you know your stuff and, and what you're trying to talk about. Santana Wilson, a cornerback out of Scottsdale, Arizona. He's the son of a former All-Pro Adrian Wilson, who's now in the Panthers organization in the executive level. Uh, Texas took him early. Terry Joseph uh, said, you know, I don't care about the rankings and where other people have him ranked. Uh, they did an early evaluation of Santana Wilson and said, let's go. Uh, he took it up and went with it. Uh, Santana Wilson, a big part of this class. Uh, and I will add this, someone similar to him, a similarity along with him and all of the DBs in this class, the extremely long arms uh, of this group. Uh, definitely part of it. All right, uh, next guy up, uh, I believe, uh, Blake, is Wardell Mack. He is uh, one of the two defensive back recruits that Texas uh, took advantage of with the Florida Gators having issues. Initially committed to Florida over LSU and Texas. Uh, some thought that he was going to bounce back to, to, to LSU after Florida started having its problems, but no, he decided to go with Texas. Uh, six foot, 175 pounds, or 170 pounds, Again, long arms. And of this group, what I really like about it is the versatility and the ability to run. Uh, Matt could play any of four positions in the secondary, in my opinion. All right, next up, Kobe Black, a young man out of uh, Waco Connolly. Uh, he is a true cornerback. He's recruited to replace Ryan Watts on that boundary corner. He's played wide receiver. He's played a little running back. He's done a little bit of everything for Waco Connolly. He is one of the bigger or better playmakers in the recruiting class for the Longhorns, in my opinion. He'll make interceptions. He'll score touchdowns. Uh, he's just one of those guys uh, that, frankly, uh, you want to have on your side when push comes to shove. Uh, next, uh, Jordan Johnson Rebel, a young man that's originally from the Fort Worth area, but transferred to IMG Academy, I think, his junior year. Uh, and uh, he plays safety, could play nickel. Uh, he is a physical football player, so don't let the size scare you at all. He is willing to give up his body uh, to make uh, the Longhorns better. Uh, that uh, that leads me to the very last guy, Xavier Filsamy, uh, out of McKinney. As you see there, 24-7 has him as a five-star. He's a consensus four-star uh, in on three, uh, six foot, 185 pounds. Uh, this is the other big commitment from uh, the University of Florida that Texas flipped. Uh, and I will add this, uh, he is indicative of the speed uh, or representative of the speed Texas is trying to grab uh, right now in the secondary, running a 10-5-2 fully automated 100. Uh, finally, uh, the last guy to mention I want to talk about is Michael Kern, uh, the punter uh, out of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, he is a top five rated punter in the country, according to Chris Saylor and Nate and Chris Cole, uh, Cole's kicking uh, out of St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, we'll see if Texas looks for a punter in the transfer portal as well with Ryan Sanborn expected to be gone this year. Um, all right, CJ, you had some uh, other news and notes. Go for it. Yeah, we talked about the Oklahoma and Texas A&M classes uh, previously. It looks like Oklahoma – We'll be signing everybody but one in their class, and it's a big one because they're, you know, in that running back market with all the departures so far in the portal. Taylor Tatum will not be signing today. He will be signing in February uh, per reports. That's a big one because, again, you know, Bobby, we've talked about how important it is to find talented running backs. Texas had the opportunity to circle back around to guys in the state of Texas, opted to pursue elsewhere. Uh, and that left a, a great spot for Oklahoma and Taylor Tatum. Right now, it looks like uh, that signature will have to wait until February. All right, guys. we got a couple of super chats that we're going to knock out real quick. And uh, let's do this first one from Ambassador of Texas. He says, we're going to look back one day and see that yours was the coop that brought Texas back. Keep up the good work on Texas football team. Hope to see you in New Orleans. We'll be there. We'll be there. Check out Texas Sugar Bowl dot, dot party. I mentioned that earlier. I'm really excited about that. CJ and I are going to be doing a live stream from there and from that party. Yes. Um, was yours the impetus to get Texas back going from a recruiting perspective? I think that I'm, I think I, I would agree with that. It was the, I, you know, while Xavier Worthy was the first great player Texas got in recruiting, I think Ewers 
you were started changing the perception that elite players in the state of Texas would go to Texas. You 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 said you agree with that, CJ. Why why do you say that? At the time, and this was before the Arch Manning recruitment, obviously, it was, you know, the highest rated recruit we have seen, you know, or, you know, the one of the five perfect quarterback or prospect ratings we've ever seen in covering recruiting. Uh, there was a lot of expectation for him. There was an obvious interest in Texas dating back to his days at South Lake Carroll. Obviously, it was Tom Herman's undoing of losing Quinn Ewers' commitment that ultimately led to this Texas job being opened back up. And as a result, you know, the, the commitment to Ohio State, the early enrollee to Ohio State and the year that he spent there, which then allowed for Sarkeesian to come back around, use the transfer portal, and really, really get that 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 statement portal edition, you know, recruitment win that you wanted. And at the, quarter, at, at the quarterback position, which means so much, uh, in terms of recruiting not only uh, portalers, but the high school realm as well. And you see it, you know, all the time, you know, recruits in this class even, you know, when is Arch going to play? Is Arch going to get in if you get in or if, if Texas gets up big? It, you know, trickles down, you know, several recruiting classes. If you have, you know, a big name, national name quarterback, and it really was the one that helped spurt Texas into – Recruiting the way that it is now, and I, 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 get, I think it's a big testament to Sarkeesian, Milwee, his staff, and to really getting the ball rolling in terms of recruiting there. All right, guys, we got to read the super chat from Alry, and he says it's going to be a good year. I'm excited for the 24th <laughs> class. Bobby and team, thanks for all the coverage on On Texas Football. Best in the business, and hook them horns. I love the 2024, Alry. You got to, you got to weigh with you, weigh with it. Let's make sure. Everybody, we're talking about recruiting here, but let's make sure we ring in the new year the right way with a win over Washington. That's that's what I think. Uh, and then look, and then let's have a hell of a party in Houston. Let, let's that's that's how this needs to go. That's how we need to start 2024. Uh, then we have another one from uh, Spence GPT two, and he says it's Ryan Wingo and an er an early enrollee. Yes, he is. Um, he is expected to be an early enrollee. He will be one. He would be one of sixteen for the Longhorns overall early enrollees. If if Texas ends up with twenty one signees here uh, today, if Aaron Hampton flips like we're kind of thinking he might, it would be sixteen of twenty one or fifteen of twenty one. Ty Anthony Smith would make sixteen of twenty two. Just think about that. Yep. That is that is full two thirds of your class, guys. Um, early awesome. enrollees that that expedites the process of getting them more ready potentially to fill holes in the SEC because you know there's going to be some you know going to a, a tougher conference later in the year you're going to need these freshmen to fill bigger roles later in the year because you're going to get banged up you're going to get Absolutely. banged up. All right, and then – oh, let me read this real quick, Bobby, from James. He says, Ryan Sanborn just accepted an invitation to play in the Hula Bowl. So Yeah, we knew he was gone. Um, we, we knew he was gone, so that's that's unfortunate. Uh, but Longhorn's got to find somebody, whether it's Michael Kern or the portal. I think I bet my, – my bet is they look for a walk-on punter in the portal so they don't have the scholarship and tr see if Michael Kern – or this walk-on guy is a one-year bridge to Michael Kern taking over full-time. Bobby, that on top of that, that, on top of that, you know, what's also important in the punting game are the Gunners. You know, Texas will be losing Keaton Crawford and Keelan Robinson. And if you look back, I, I think I even made a highlight tape of two of them down in kicks, you know, inside the five or, you know, tackling or punt returners right off the, right off the catch. That is just as important as a good punter, in my opinion. And, you know, Jeff Banks has, you know, clearly a stable of guys that he trusts. I think Trey Wisner fits the mold of guys that will fit into that position next year as well. Uh, but I, I think it's also important to – what's that? That's exactly who I wrote down. Yep. But Trey I, I think that's just as important as uh, of the conversation of who will be the next punter, but who will also be filling in that gunner role as well. Yeah. I, I think Wisner fits that role. I think Jelani McDonald might uh, fit that role. I'll tell you another guy, Warren Roberson. Yeah. So Definitely. those two, they Texas has got some guys that have a little something, a little grit to them. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. That's those are the kind of guys you want in that role. All right. Well, Sanborn, obviously out of eligibility, but congratulations to him to for getting that. All right. And then Freelance Society says, do you think Sark will ever give up play calling? I like when coaches are actually involved versus game management. I don't think so. And it, you're 12 and one. Why the hell do you do it? You know, excuse my French there, but uh, I wouldn't. I mean, he's look, I mean, he's done pretty darn good with this, this, this year with 12 and one, I know people were calling for that at five and seven. They were calling for it at eight and five because of the second half woes. You know what I mean? And I think that there's some legitimacy to that, but I also think that part of that was the defenses they were facing that three high safety gave him some problems. I, he had, he did not have an experienced quarterback either last year or his first year. Now he's finally had an experienced quarterback. He, he could throw out there. That's kind of changed that perception, I think, overall, uh, for in my opinion. Yep. Okay, guys, this next one is from David Brown. He says, thanks for all y'all do. David, thank you for the super chat and for tuning in and being a part of today's special episode, for sure, and each and every yeah, thanks, day. David. Thanks, and David. Thanks, David. Rudy, with the super chat, says, any up, any update on Akana? Do y'all think he'll be a big part of the defense next season or more development needed? CJ, I know you're high on him. I'll let you speak to this. Yeah, I like Tosili Akana a lot. The issue with Tosili was – he just wasn't college ready in terms of his, his physical presence. You know, I saw him in San Antonio last year for the, the all American bowl down there. He weighed in at about a, a buck 96. And I think he eventually got up to about 225 and as the season progressed, but that's still not, you know, ready. And especially as you head into the sec, he needs to be around 240, 245 before I feel, you know, comfortable enough to let him go uh, for extended snaps. So, it's not that he doesn't have the talent. It's just that his body wasn't physical, uh, physically ready at the time. So uh, we'll see, you know, going into the spring because, you know, that's when the competition will surely pick up again. Texas has a lot of edge rushers, uh, again, coming into this this picture uh, for the 2024 season. I'm hopeful he'll be a rotational guy, but I think that's asking a lot uh, in terms of getting your body right and obviously with returning Ethan Burke uh you know, Baron Sorrell, Justice Finkley, Colin Simmons will be joining the fold, possibly Trey Moore as well. There, there will be a lot of bodies right there. I'm thinking 2025 is where we'll really start seeing a push from uh, Tassili Akana. All right, Bobby, before we get out of here, I'm going to let you and CJ give everybody the latest news, kind of a rundown of, you know, what to expect for the rest of the day, all that good stuff. Yep, uh, waiting on Aaron uh, Hampton. Uh, I think that may be the next thing to drop unless, of course, Ryan Wingo announces his decision or finalizes his decision. Uh, Hampton could peel off and go to Alabama. According to the Tex Texarkana game day, he's expected to sign now at noon. Uh, he has been committed to Texas, but there's some thought that Alabama may be the leader. I'm, I think it's actually more likely he goes to Alabama at this point than Texas. We'll see if I'm right or not. Uh, then we have Ryan Wingo of the uh, commitments to Texas uh, that have not announced or have not done anything today. He is one of those big ones that Texas is waiting for, the five-star uh, wide receiver out of St. Louis that was a very difficult recruitment going back and forth between multiple teams around the country. Uh, Texas trying to outlast Missouri at this point, uh, the Longhorns uh, with two five-stars already. Uh, uh, Wingo would give them three on the campaign. Uh, then we also have... Ty Anthony Smith, the linebacker out of Jasper, who is expected to announce his decision no later than 6.15 tonight at his high school gymnasium, uh, they're, where they're having a signing ceremony for all the players uh, from Jasper. Uh, anything else? Oh, the Derek Lagway, do we know if he just take, taking other, way, other, other news around the country right now and around the state? Do we know if Derek Lagway signed anywhere today yet, CJ? Uh, Taylor Tatum, you talked about anything else that we want to update people on? Yeah, it, it looks like he will have a signing day event around 3.30 Central Time. Lagway? Uh, Lagway, Lagway will be signing today, uh, 3.30 Central Time. That was just uh, reported by uh, On3, Nick De La Torre um, of Gators Online. So that will be interesting. You know, that you know is a big-time recruit, national player of the year in some instances. So uh, a, a lot of eyeballs headed there and a lot of attention on where he will end up. 
Um, and then Taylor Tatum, you said not signing now for Oklahoma, the talented running back out of Longview. Um, all right. I, I think that's going to do it, guys, uh, for this morning's coffee and football. You, thank you all for staying with us uh, this whole time. We'll be back probably around 1155 uh, to get ready for Aaron Hampton's uh, pledge. And then, CJ, you're headed over uh, to uh, the, uh, the football facility uh, and the stadium uh, to see and talk with Steve Sarkeesian. Uh, about uh, the uh, recruiting class for his media availability uh, as well. Uh, Billy, come back with coffee because I'm going to have another cup here right now. We're going to take about a 30 to 45 minute break uh, before we come back at it. Uh, Rod Babers and I have talked about the state of the program. We've got that coming up for you guys uh, this next hour. The thing with that, uh, I would say about the state of the program, Rod and I did a like a like almost like a heat check on the room's that Texas has the quarterback room, the running back room and where they sit right now with this incoming class and the pieces they have it coming back for this spring. I think you guys uh, will enjoy it. If you uh, listen to it. All right. Uh, CJ uh, Blake, you guys are awesome, man. I appreciate you. Blake, you do not get enough credit. Got it. Blake, oh, you do not awesome. get enough credit. Yeah, thank you, Blake. Awesome Tremendous. work you do. Uh, Matt, our producer has been here the whole time as well. I'm making up those graphics. Uh, guys, thank you all for joining us uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. We'll be back in about an hour. Time to get some grub and uh, take care of our, ourselves first for a little bit. Uh, but I want to say thank you all and hook them. Congrats to Steve Sarkeesian uh, for what looks like another top five recruiting class. That's right. And don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. We'd appreciate that. And then, of course, we'll be back regular time tomorrow morning, starting about 8, 10 a.m. for coffee and football. But be sure to just stay here all day right here on On Texas Football for around-the-clock recruiting coverage, anything else that may pop off. And for Bobby Burton and C.J. Vogel, I'm Blake Monroe, and we'll see you next time. Have a good lunch, guys. <laughs>